order. We shall come almost imminently to important business, and indeed we now do so. We come now to motion number four relating to the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. I have provisionally selected the following amendments, colleagues, in the following order. A, in the name of the Leader of the Opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. K, in the name of the Right Honourable Member for Ross, Skye and Lochaba, Mr Ian Blackford. C, in the name of the Right Honourable Member for Meriden, Dame Caroline Spellman. B, in the name of the Honourable Member for South Leicestershire, Alberto Costa. And F, in the name of the Right Honourable Member for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford, Yvette Cooper. I remind the House that reference may be made in debate to any of the amendments on the paper, including those which I have not selected. I remind the House that under the terms of the business motion just agreed to, the debate may continue until 7 p.m., at which time the questions will be put on any amendments which may then be moved. To move the motion, I call the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and Minister for the Cabinet Office, Minister David Liddington. Yeah. Mr Speaker, sir, um, it's a pleasure, as always, to be returning to debate uh, European policy matters uh, and, to, and to see the, the, the familiar cast of um, colleagues in, in all sides of the, the House. Um, I, beg, I beg to move uh, the words in, on the order paper standing in the name of my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister. And I want to start, uh, Mr Speaker, by making it clear that the government's political objectives remain to leave the European Union in accordance with the referendum decision of 2016, to do so uh, in an orderly fashion that protects jobs, living standards and investment in this country, to do so by means of a formal withdrawal agreement under Article 50, which includes clear protections for European Union citizens living in the United Kingdom and United Kingdom citizens in the 27 other EU countries, which provides for a financial settlement and which ensures that there is no hard border on the island of Ireland. And we look forward to negotiating a deep and special partnership on trade, security and political cooperation with the European Union, a community of democracies which will remain not only our closest geographical neighbours, but key partners, friends and allies in the world. Give way to my honourable friend, Mr Stone, well, to my right honourable friend, with whom I have been debating these matters for the best part of 30 years. Uh, I want to ask him, in relation to this issue of community of democracies, how he can, how he can justify Article 4 of the Withdrawal Agreement, which would subjugate the United Kingdom and require us to pass primary legislation to achieve that objective when the decisions which will be imposed on the citizens of every single member in this House by virtue of the, what goes on in the Council of Ministers will be decided by 27 other member states. We won't even be at the table and without even so much as a transcript. Is it not a complete travesty of democracy? No, I mean, I, as, as my honourable friend says, he and I have been debating European matters for about 30 years. Time does fly when one is enjoying oneself. Uh, and the, um, I, I, the, the, the point I make to him is, is this, that I think he, his criticisms would have force if they were describing a situation which was intended to be permanent. All that is covered in that article of the withdrawal agreement to which he is referring are the arrangements that are necessary to govern the winding down of this country's membership of the European Union and the residual obligations uh, that derive from that over a period of months and years. Give way to my honourable friend member for Dover first, please. I thank my uh, right honourable friend for, for giving way. There have been 
a number of statements made by a number of different ministers in recent days uh, that have left me somewhat puzzled as to, first of all, what the policy of Her Majesty's Government is, and also what the policy of Her Majesty's Government is in relation to collective responsibility. Would it be able to provide some clarification to assist the House? The, the policy of the, the Government is what the Prime Minister set out in a statement yesterday and summarised in uh, the words I have just spoken. The approach to collective responsibility is set out clearly in the Ministerial Code. I will give way to my right hon. Friend and then to the right hon. Member Birkenhead. Uh, on a more positive note, um, in order to get this withdrawal agreement through, which we should all want to do, does my right hon. Friend agree that it is not necessary to unpick the withdrawal agreement? We could, under international law, have a conditional interpretative declaration stating the backstop is not permanent. And then if we get that, and if the Attorney General changes his mind, will my honourable friend join me in urging all my Brexiteer colleagues to vote for this agreement because the choice is no longer perhaps between an imperfect deal and no deal, it is between an imperfect deal and no Brexit. Well said. Quite right. I, I agree very much with what my, uh, my honourable friend has, has said, and I think we, were, we would all wish um, my right honourable and learned friend, the Attorney General, well in the talks that he is continuing with representatives of the European Commission. Give way to the right honourable gentleman. I'm immensely grateful to uh, um, the Secretary of State giving away. Um, he, is he aware that the, the, the atmosphere in this debate is changing from one which is massively concerned about crashing out and the damage that might do to those of us who want to leave worrying about we will get no Brexit at all and therefore might I through him address the, the grouping that normally sits behind him in that direction that the choice that we will face when the Prime Minister's um, motion comes back is whether we have the certainty of some deal or as his right on uh, and learned friend said no deal at all I, I, I think that the right honourable gentleman does uh, encapsulate in his remarks um, very accurately the decision that faces every honourable member of this House, whichever political party or grouping they come from. I'll give way to the right honourable gentleman, then to the honourable lady. For giving way. This may help us later on in the debate. I'm just wondering if uh, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister could give some clarity on, on whether, in fact, the Government are going to be supporting Amendment B later on in relation to the amendment table by the Member for, for South Leicestershire. Because, as I understand it, uh, he has been sacked for putting this forward, but in fact, it was something the Home Secretary was supporting. So I'm, I'm confused. Could he set out where the Government stand on this issue? Uh, it, it, it may not be the first or last time the right honourable gentleman has been confused, but I, I, I think he will have to contain, contain his excitement uh, uh, and, uh, till, I, till I can, if I uh, get through a number of interventions, Mr Speaker, um, make progress to deal with the amendments that have been tabled. I guess I, I, if I, the honourable lady will forgive me, I had indicated I was going to give way to the right honourable member, the, the chair of the select committee, then I will come to her. I am very grateful to the Secretary of State for giving way. Following the Prime Minister's statement yesterday, can he just clarify something? If the Prime Minister's deal when it returns to the House is defeated and leaving with no deal is also defeated by the House, will the motion that will be brought on the 14th of March proposing an extension to Article 50 and setting out the proposed time period, will that time period be capable of amendment by the House? In the, whether a motion is capable of amendment and which amendments are in, in order is, of course, always a matter for the chair um, rather than for ministers. Uh, but I would point out to the right honourable gentleman that, in addition to the opportunities for amendment that would arise on such a motion in the normal course of events, and I can't predict at this moment how the chair will rule. Uh, that the obligations on the government in the circumstances he's described in respect of Section 13 of the EU Withdrawal Act will also remain. You wait on the lady from North Down. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I am very grateful indeed to the Minister. Um, the Minister will, of course, be um, well aware that we are approaching the 21st anniversary of the signing of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement on the 10th of April, just days after we are due to Brexit. So, 
I have assumed, and I want the Minister to confirm this, that in light of the Government's repeated uh, emphasis on its commitment to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement throughout the Brexit negotiations, and quite rightly so, that the Government has been busy organising, planning a significant event to mark its commitment to the Belfast Agreement. Would the Minister just shed some light on that particular anniversary event? Well, I, I, I think that the, the detail of any uh, events to, to mark this anniversary uh, would be a matter for my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, uh, to announce. But I, what I can say to the, to the honourable lady is this: that the government, and certainly I personally, would regard the achievement of the Belfast Agreement and the development of the peacemaking and peace-building process in Northern Ireland as one of the most signal political achievements of successive governments of different political parties in this country during uh, the, my career in this House. I can remember uh, being called to meeting with other uh, government backbenchers uh, in John Major's office when he first reported on the message that he had received from uh, the back channels to Sinn Féin IRA about the prospects of a process opening up. And I, I know how much he, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron and my right honourable friend, the present Prime Minister, have committed themselves to that process. And that is something, uh, that commitment is something which I believe every honourable member of this House will, will share. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to give way to the Honourable Gentleman from the SNP uh, and, and the Honourable Gentleman, and then I am going to make some progress. Uh, I thank the uh, Minister for giving way. Would he agree with me that the phrase government policy implies not just the offering of a choice to the House, but the expression by the government of a preference as to the outcome of that choice? And if he does agree with that, will he say today to inform the debate what the government's policy will be on either voting for a no deal Brexit? or extending Article 50? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, the, the Honourable Gentleman is asking me to speculate, speculate about hypothetical events. Where my energies and the government's energies are focused is on achieving a negotiated agreement with the European Union, yeah. behind which a majority of right honourable and honourable members in this House are prepared to rally. Yeah. Give way to the honourable gentleman, and I'll move on. I thank the uh, Secretary State for giving no. way. And in relation to the point you just answered from the uh, chair of the Select Committee, um, the Prime Minister was very, very clear in what she said yesterday. She said that if the House voted for an extension, um, that, uh, that she would bring forward the necessary legislation to change the exit date commensurate with that extension. Could you just provide some more clarity on that? Is he talking about, for example, bringing in a statutory instrument immediately after such a vote uh, to make that happen, or some other sort of way of changing uh, the date in the bill? It would be very helpful to have some clarity on that point. Well, I will, I, will, I will come to that point perhaps when I address the amendments in the name of my right honourable friend, the Member for Meriden. Um, I, I, I do want I will give way to the Chairman of the Select Committee and I will make some progress. I am very grateful to my right honourable well, friend. friend. Would he agree with me, further point made by the Honourable Lady of the Member for North Down, that a good way to commemorate the signing of the uh, Good Friday Agreement would be to encourage the European Union to define what it meant by temporary, uh, as listed in Article 1, Clause 4 uh, of the Northern Ireland Protocol? Since without some certainty on that, it is difficult to see how the withdrawal agreement is compatible with the Good Friday Agreement. That, uh, the, the, this question about the definition of temporary is uh, uh, an important one, uh, particularly in the light of the position that the European Union has consistently taken in, in negotiations with us over the last two years, that a withdrawal agreement negotiated under the terms of Article 50 cannot be a secure legal basis for the creation of a permanent partnership with a third country. Now, Mr Speaker, if um, the House will forgive me, I think I have given way quite a lot and I do want to move on to the substance of my speech. Um, I mean, at the end of the debate this afternoon, this House will have a choice uh, in respect of the Government motion and the various amendments which you have selected, but by the 12th of March at the latest, it will have a more important choice when we bring back a second meaningful vote. 
And there's been a lot of speculation, and already we've, we've heard that in the debate this afternoon about what should happen if the House declined then to vote for a deal. Let me start by saying why I am confident that the Prime Minister will be able to put before the House a deal that it can support, and why this House should support such a deal. My right honourable friend spoke yesterday of the extensive work that has been taking place to make good on the call from this House for legal changes to guarantee that the Northern Ireland backstop cannot endure indefinitely. And since the 29th of January, when this House endorsed an amendment tabled by my right honourable friend, the member for Altrincham and Sale West, uh, my right honourable friends, the Prime Minister, the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, the Attorney General and I have been engaging in focused discussions with the EU, with the different institutions of the Union and with Member State Governments to find a way forward that would work for both sides. And we are making good progress in that work with constructive discussions taking place this week. Honourable Members will also have heard that there have been discussions too on the political declaration including additions or changes that increase the focus and ambition of both sides to deliver the future partnership we both seek as soon as possible. And the ideas that we are, we are putting forward in these discussions are not simply the government's. They reflect the intensive dialogue we've had with members from across this House, including the, the conversations we've had with honourable members from other political parties, and I, I myself have you know, met the Right Honourable Member Hoban St Pancras once, keen to do so again, as he knows, as well as meeting colleagues in other political parties and representative of all different shades of opinion on this country's relationship with the European Union. I'll give way to my Right Honourable Friend. My Right Honourable Friend, he's, he really has been very generous. Just before he moves on for the question of alternative arrangements, um, he and uh, his uh, colleague, the Right Honourable Member, who's the, the, the Brexit Secretary, are to be strongly congratulated for getting the European Union to accept the need to set up a task force of experienced officials on the European side and the UK side to work up the arrangement proposed by the, our working group. Um, could he guarantee that those proposals, once accepted, there will be a commitment in the agreement, in the treaty, that will be legally binding and will commit the Government and the European Union to a definite and definitive date by which they will be implemented? Um, Mr. Mr Speaker, I mean, my, my right honourable friend from Oswald Street has, has uh, championed this uh, uh, approach uh, for, for a long time now, and I am grateful to him and to other colleagues on this side of the House for the detailed discussions that have taken place uh, with my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, and others. Uh, about alternative arrangements to ensure the absence of a hard border in Northern Ireland. Let's not forget that this term, alternative arrangements, features in both the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration. They are already known concepts in the documents that uh, have previously been agreed. So this has led, as my, as this has led, as my, I'm, I'm trying to reply to my right honourable friend. This, this has led to the consideration of a joint work stream with the European Union that will take place during the next phase of our negotiations. Our objective is to ensure that we have a set of alternative arrangements that can be used even in the absence of a full future relationship deal at the end of the implementation period. And the EU has agreed to prioritise what will be an important work stream in the next phase, but we will also be setting up here domestic structures to take advice from external experts, from businesses who trade with the European Union and beyond, and from colleagues across this House. This will be supported by civil service resources and £20 million of government funding. Give way to the Honourable Lady. So for giving way. He mentions the hard border and the, and, and the uh, backstop. Uh, does he understand why the Irish Government last week produced uh, a legal uh, bill going through Parliament to deal with any problem to do with the WTO if we happen to go out on WTO terms. And yet there was no mention whatsoever of any infrastructure, any hard border. How come the Irish Government can do that and at the same time we are saying that the hard border is such a huge big issue? It's, uh, which is for the Irish Government to explain their policy. What we also have to, and I, I'm assuming they will have to, to deal with also, is the reality of the 
plans that the European Union Commission published in December last year, in which they stated very plainly that from the day the United Kingdom departs the EU, that in the absence of a transitional period, as provided for under the withdrawal agreement, uh, from day one, the full EU acquis in terms of tariffs and regulatory checks and inspections would have to be applied. And, and one of the things that was striking about that Commission publication was it made no specific reference or, or provided no exemption for the situation in Ireland. Now, that is something for the, the Government of Ireland to take up with the European Commission, but that is part of the legal and political reality with which governments are also, also dealing. I, I give way to the Honourable Lady. I'm very grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman for giving away. He's been very generous with his interventions. I wonder if I can just pursue the question that was asked by the Honourable Gentleman for North Shropshire. Would I be correct in understanding that these discussions that are going on about the backstop relate purely to the next phase of the negotiations and what can be done in relation to the political declaration and do not involve any question of opening up the withdrawal agreement and changing the force of the withdrawal agreement. That's what it is, isn't it? If you look at the Prime Minister's statement yesterday, it was all about the next phase. A work stream in the next phase is the uh, phrase that the uh, honourable gentleman just used. Can he clarify that? It's not about opening up the withdrawal agreement. It would be. The Honourable Lady, that uh, the, when the, the Attorney General has been talking to representatives of the European Commission this week, when my right honourable friend, the State of State, has been talking to representatives of the European Commission, they have been talking about changes to the overall terms of the agreement to facilitate our orderly departure from the European Union. Uh, I, I'll give way to the right honourable lady and then to the honourable gentleman, then I will move on. Now, the Right Honourable Gentleman for giving way, and I'd like to thank him for what he did yesterday with the publication of the summary of the No Deal papers, if I put it in that way. But my question to him is this. Why are we, or rather, why is the government only now, after two and a half years, <coughs> looking at these alternative arrangements, when in any event, the Northern Ireland Select Committee did an enormous amount of work at finding some alternatives. They travelled the world and they came to the conclusion that there are no alternatives mm -hmm. some considerable time ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, um, the, the, the Right Honourable Lady, first of all, can I thank the Right Honourable Lady for, for, for what she, she said in respect of the papers we published yesterday. Um, I thought she was being uncharacteristically um, unfair to the government in. Uh, her criticisms about, about um, not dealing with this earlier. I think, I, I think that uh, the <laughs> truth is that a lot of both official and ministerial time was spent uh, over the last 18 months in examining some of these. One, one of the problems that uh, was identified, and, we, and which still confronts us today, in which we, know we, are, we are talking to the European Commission about in the, the context of these discussions about alternative arrangements, is that uh, we have to deal not only with the problem of t the technology itself and making sure that there is technology that is fit for purpose, but we would, al but we would also, um, uh, on the sort of model that, that has been discussed, um, need to see quite a significant number of derogations by the EU from its normal uh, 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 arrangements. And so there, there, there are legal and not just technical problems that would have to be, have to be overcome. Give way to the Honourable Gentleman, then I'm going to make progress. Would the, would the uh, Honourable Member agree that because the political declaration is legally non-binding, any concessions he gives on the level of alignment to the Single Market and Customs Union standards, the environment, are intrinsically changeable in the future, and that the only safeguard in place to stop a sort of slash-and-burn approach to a future Tory government is the backstop itself? That, uh, well, I, 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 I place rather more faith in this House than the, the Honourable Gentleman would appear to do, because I, I don't think that there is any appetite in, in Parliament for um, a, what he described as a slash-and-burn approach to standards. Now, Mr Speaker, we believe that uh, our deal is the right one for this country, and there is no better deal that is available on the table. I also so believe, the Government believes, 
that leaving with our deal is better than leaving without a deal. Um, on the, it is, uh, I'll give way to my honourable friend since he, he, he tried valiantly to persuade the uh, Mr Speaker to accept uh, uh, an amendment that was unsuccessful. I'll, I'll let him in now. <laughs> First of all, I, 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 I hope uh, my right honourable Absolutely. friend will agree that am Amendment J, which unfortunately wasn't tabled, but I'm sure the government will have no um, problem with Amendment and accepting Amendment J, at least in principle, and I look forward to hearing about that. But can I just put this to my right honourable friend? For many of us who have wished the Prime Minister well, we recognise that compromise is required on both sides in these negotiations. The transition period isn't brilliant, but the backstop does have to be sorted out with regard to its indefinite nature. In recognising that, does my right honourable friend, is he at all concerned that the next steps, as outlined by the Prime Minister yesterday, just perhaps might make a good deal less likely, because the EU may hope that Parliament does its work for it by taking no deal off the yeah. table yeah. and extending Article 50. Yeah. I, I, genuinely, I genuinely don't fear that, because um, I mean, what I'm finding increasingly in my conversations with uh, politicians in different parts of Europe is that they want this issue sorted out. Um, frankly, they have got politics of their own. They have got important decisions on a whole range of subjects from the future of the Eurozone to the uh, negotiation of a multi-annual financial framework without a United Kingdom contribution to the tensions that exist between um, some of the Central European and Western European powers within the European Union to the continuing problem of very large-scale movement of people from Africa into southern Europe. And it, it would be a mistake uh, for honourable members to think that the leaders of the other 27 countries spend every waking hour thinking and worrying about Brexit matters. Give, I'll give way to the, the right honourable member for old time's sake, then I'll come back to the honourable member for Yard, yeah, then the honourable lady. Then I'll... I'm extremely grateful to the Secretary of State. He's been very, and if I may say so, typically generous in giving way to members from all sides of the House. He was just referring to the position of other member states. Yesterday, the Prime Minister told us for the first time that she would countenance an extension to the Article 50 period. But today, President Macron of France is quoted as saying, we would agree to an Article 50 extension only if it is justified by a new choice of the British. In no way would we accept an extension without a clear objective. Isn't it the case that if there is to be an extension, there must be an extension with a purpose Absolutely. rather than for two or three months of the same parliamentary gridlock? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with the right honourable gentleman. And I, do, I don't think what he's just said is any different from what the Prime Minister or other ministers have been saying at this dispatch box for several, several months now. Give way to honourable member. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, unfortunately, of course, my amendment G to uh, end the whole charade of uh, the revoking Article 50 is not accepted at all. We've got a series of uh, Brexit enabling amendments uh, down today. But I want to thank the, the, um, the uh, Minister back to this one point on, on the concessions you're looking for the European Union and borders. So we know the technology is not inv invented, but the idea is we have derogations, so we, there are concessions. Now, if the European Union is going to be giving concessions for that, on that border, we'd have to give them on every border, and the European Union owns multiple borders. Yeah. So why wouldn't the European Union be doing this already? The reason they're not is because we're back to UK, behind the sky, fantasy thinking, and I here, hope here. he accepts that. I think, I think the flaw in the, the Honourable Gentleman's logic is, was, was this, that, that um, it should be something that would be welcome to any uh, government or any supranational authority like the European Commission, if, te if technology and systems are available which streamline border processes, whether we were talking about the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland or the border across the short straits 
or other external borders of the European Union with third countries. I will give way to the Lady of Totnes. I thank the Secretary of State for giving way. I am um, glad that the Government has published at least the summary of the No Deal consequences and hope that they will go much further and publish the detail. But can I ask the Secretary of State, has he also seen this week in The Lancet yes. the detailed paper yes. that has been published about the health consequences of No Deal? Um, and will he assure me that if he has not seen it, that he will look in detail at those consequences? Yeah, yeah. Because I believe no responsible government could Quite inflict right. that kind of pain on its people. Yeah, yeah, well I haven't seen the, the, that particular paper. I will um, make sure I, I look at it and draw it to the attention of my right hon. Friend, the Secretary of State for Health. What I would say, I hope by way of some reassurance to the hon. Lady, is that the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care has been making these preparations uh, one of his very top priorities. He um, uh, wrote to uh, the uh, leaders of the um, health care uh, and uh, pharmaceutical sectors in December last year, and the NHS uh, executive is working very hard on making sure that arrange contingency arrangements are in place to ensure that the supplies of medicines continue to be available. Yes, I haven't given way to, to the honourable lady before, so I will I am very grateful to for him uh, for giving way, and I wanted to just be a little bit helpful, because in his response to the honourable member uh, on the benches next to me, he basically said that he didn't see any difference between what President Macron was saying and what the Prime Minister was saying yesterday. There is a huge difference. What the Prime Minister was saying yesterday was that she would use any extension for more dither, delay, faffing, kicking the can down the road. What President Macron is saying is that there has to be a purpose, and that the purpose that is is gaining more and more credibility across the House is precisely to put this to a public vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it, first of all, I think, I think that the Honourable, Honourable Lady does not characterise the Prime Minister's words yesterday accurately uh, uh, at all. And the, the Prime Minister could not have been clear in many appearances at this dispatch box that in every conversation we have had with the European Commission or um, heads of member state governments, they have said that, that were we to uh, at any stage seek an extension of Article 50, they would want to understand for how long that was being sought and the purpose for, that, for which that was being sought. So I, I do not think that anything that President Macron said today comes as a, as a shock to us. Now, I, I do, I, if the Honourable Member will forgive me, I will try and give way to him later, but if he will let me, let me move on for the moment. Um, the, the, um, I said, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, that we, the Government believes that leaving with our deal is better than leaving without a deal. And uh, honourable members who have seen the, paper, the summary paper published yesterday um, will know that, and from other sources too, that there is no avoiding the fact that a, an abrupt departure from the European Union without an agreement of any kind would lead to a shock uh, to our economy and that it would not be possible for a government, even with the most meticulous planning of uh, arrangements in this country, to mitigate and plan entirely for what might be happening out with our own jurisdiction. And we would be reliant in those circumstances, for example, on the readiness of the authorities in France and elsewhere to introduce streamlined checks and procedures or the readiness of the European Commission to uh, allow a derogation short term from its normal uh, rules and practices. Um, as a responsible government, we have therefore been taking appropriate steps to minimise that disruption and have published extensive information to ensure the country is prepared. We have published and updated 106 technical notices and contacted the 145,000 businesses who trade with the European Union to help them prepare for no deal customs procedures. And, and it is, Mr Speaker, a fact that as long as this House is unable to agree to an alternative course of action and get behind a particular uh, agreement on exit from the European Union, then businesses and individuals will have to plan for and take action as well. And the Government has taken and will continue to take steps 
to provide businesses and citizens with advice to help them make preparations to mitigate the potential impacts of a, of a no-deal Brexit. And the paper yesterday showed that there is more action businesses should consider taking and which the Government urges them to plan for as necessary. I give way to my hon. Friend and then to the Lady. Now I am moving on. I was grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. I think the whole House appreciates his generosity over this. As the uh, honourable gentleman knows, the meaningful vote needs to return to this House by the 12th of March. If that vote falls, within the following day, presumably, move on to whether or not we rule out no deal. Could I ask the uh, right honourable gentleman whether he and other members of the government will vote in favour or against that? I mean, the one, one thing I have learned, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't blame my model friend for having a good try, but one thing I, I have learned um, uh, in my years here, and perhaps been reinforced by observing events in recent weeks, is that um, uh, I may, may um, want at some stage to give advice to my right honourable friends, the Chief Whip and the Prime Minister, about whipping for any actual or hypothetical motion, but I'm not going to do it from the dispatch box, but do it in, do it in private in, instead. I'll give way to my honourable friend. I'm very grateful for my honourable friend um, giving way. I'm sure my honourable friend will be aware that a lot of small businesses have not put in place the preparations, and many of them may have been misled uh, or under the impression by comments made in this House that tariff-free trade may be available for 10 years under the GATT 24 provisions. The uh, document published by the Government makes that crystal clear that, that those provisions are not available. And can I encourage uh, my honourable friend to make that clear so that small businesses in my constituency and around the country are not, uh, do not rely on what they may think has been publicised as being an option when it isn't. This makes a, makes a, a, a good point. Uh, and uh, as, as our right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for International Trade, has publicly um, you know, uh, rebutted the, uh, the arguments about um, Article 24 of, of, of the uh, uh, general uh, agreement on tariffs and trade, uh, and the, the reference in the paper published yesterday was a, a reference to the Trade Secretary's remarks, and the Government is uh, stepping up its communications to business about this point. And we, we accept that in this country, also, um, I believe in our major trading partners, such as France and Germany, it tends to be small and medium-sized enterprises who, for all the obvious reasons, don't have the capacity to spend a lot of time monitoring what yes. governments are saying, uh, and therefore, uh, therefore may be further behind in their planning than the larger companies, and we will do our utmost to try to, uh, to, to, to communicate with them better. Uh, Mr Speaker, if uh, I, I may... Uh, I, I beg the right on the ladies' part. I, I will give way to her. Then, then I would like to come on and address the various amendments that have been selected. I thank the um, Secretary of State for giving way. The reason that the question from the member for Dartford, Dartford um, uh, is so important is because businesses are already still worrying that they are having to move money, jobs and assets abroad because they don't know what is going on. And the Minister could give huge clarity to those businesses if the Government simply said they will vote against yep. no deal yeah, yeah, if it comes yeah. to a vote right, right. on March the 13th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is really important because we need to know the status of the commitments that were made by yeah, the Prime yeah, Minister yeah, yeah. yesterday exactly. because the Brexit Secretary has previously dismissed yeah. motions passed by this yes, House. He, has. he yes, said he has. that legislation, frankly, the legislation yes. takes precedence yep. over the yes. motion yes. and has a referring to previous motions against no deal. And he has also said that the government's policy continued to be to leave with no deal yep. on March the 29th if there wasn't a deal passed by this House. Yep. Could he now confirm that as a result of the uh, Prime Minister's in that statement yesterday, that policy has now changed and the government policy is at least 
simply to be bound by the will of this House if, a ver if no deal is passed by March the 13th, rather than simply to leave without a deal? Yeah. In my, my, the short answer to the right hon. Lady is yes. I, I will flesh this out when I, when I respond in more detail to the amendments which have been selected, but the uh, the words that my right hon. Friend the Prime Minister used yesterday were words that had been discussed and agreed at the Cabinet meeting yesterday morning. I would just say to her, in, in, in terms of her earlier uh, question to me, um, that I, I do think she is leaping too lightly over the fact that it is the Government's clear intention, before we get into any uh, debates or motions uh, about how we respond to a potential decision on exiting without a deal, that to bring forward to this House a motion on a revised deal and to invite the House to support that. I will be supporting the Government when that uh, vote is brought forward, just as I supported the Government uh, on the previous meaningful vote. And that, that decision will remain the earliest possible opportunity for this House to end the uncertainty that businesses and individuals now experience, as she rightly said. Now, if I can turn, if I can... I think the question being asked by my honourable friend, Member for Dartford and the honourable lady is absolutely key to understanding what the Prime Minister said yesterday. I entirely understand, and he's retreating as the Prime Minister does, to the argument that the aim is to get a withdrawal agreement, and I, I support what he says on that. But if it doesn't get a majority, and it was defeated by 230 at the first attempt, the key thing to know is whether the government will actually vote in favour of an extension, or whether the government is going to vote in favour of leaving with no deal. And the Cabinet must have considered that when they sorted out their differences in no doubt a perfectly private, orderly and good-humoured meeting yesterday. It's a, I mean, the, I mean my, my, my right honourable friend is, and learned friend is, is, is uh, asking me to, uh, to, to comment on a, a hy hypothetical whipping decision, on a hypothetical, <laughs> hypothetical vote, which it's the government's wish and intention, we don't actually have to confront because we will be voting as a House in favour of the revised deal. Um, which will reflect elements that this House, uh, on the 29th of last month, said that it wanted to see changed in order to be able to support the withdrawal agreement wholeheartedly. And, and exactly the same, the same challenge that my right and learned friend pose, uh, has posed is what would be posed with respect of any hypothetical event on the, on the bill that was proposed by the right honourable lady, the member for Pontefract and, and Castleford. And I think at this stage it is, it is too, too early to, to make those assertions on a, a hypothetical. What, 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 um, what we are focused on, where our energies are in government, is on negotiating an agreement with our partners in the European Union, which delivers on the conditions which this House set when it passed the, uh, motion, the, the amendment in the name of my right honourable friend, the member for Altrincham and Sale West. I will give way one last time to the honourable friend, the member for Yeovil, then I am going to make some progress. I'm never going to get on these amendments. Very, very grateful to my right, right honourable friend. Just before he moves on, I just would like to ask one question about the No, no Deal Advice paper. When, when was it uh, prepared, um, and why, why didn't it mention the use of the transit system, which actually can mean, mean that goods are delivered well, well into Europe and don't have to be stopped and checked at Calais? The, uh, the in instructions instructions were given to draft that paper following the debate last week, during which the Right Honourable Lady, the member for Broxtow, agreed to withdraw the amendment in her name calling for the publication of Cabinet papers, um, following an assurance given 
from the dispatch box by my honourable friend, the Parliamentary Secretary at the Department of Exiting the European Union. Uh, I spoke then to the Right Honourable Lady to ascertain the information that she wanted, and what we have produced is a document which I believe is thorough, which um, I am satisfied uh, can be traced in all details to documents that have gone before Cabinet or Cabinet committees. Uh, and it, you know, internally, I have you know, been able to footnote every. Uh, every assertion made in that paper, uh, but we, we took the words of the Right Honourable Lady's amendment in seeking material that had been given to Cabinet and Cabinet committees, and the content of the document was determined by, by that categorisation. And since I have referred to I will give way to once what, and then I am going to make progress. Gentle, uh, as ever, Mr Speaker, is being very generous, but it is very important to make it clear. I have seen, I just took a, a, a sample of the many papers from which this document has been compiled, and I can assure the House that from my reading of the contents of those papers, this was an accurate and fair summary. And the other thing is, Mr Speaker, is that the original document that I was given was then edited because it was updated. That's how up to date it was, and I'm confident about that. I now want the detail, but that's another matter. I'm very grateful to the, to the right honourable lady. If I can now move on to the various amendments that have been, been tabled, and if I can uh, move straight to Amendment F in the name of um, uh, the right honourable lady member for Pontefract and Castle, third by right honourable friends, the members for West Dorset and Meriden. And, and the right honourable gentleman starts on this important process of critical analysis to which we all look forward with eager anticipation. I simply point out to him, as I'm sure he's aware, that he's, he's currently on 44 minutes. Um, a snip, I know, but 44 minutes. Minister. Restra Mr Speaker, I will try and restrain my appetite to give way to, to interventions further. Um, yesterday, the Prime Minister set out three clear commitments to the House that should provide reassurance and clarity about the way forward. First, we will hold a second meaningful vote by Tuesday, the 12th of March, at the latest. Secondly, if the government have not uh, brought, brought forward a further meaningful vote, or if we have lost such a second meaningful vote by Tuesday, the 12th of March, then we will, in addition, and I stress this is in addition, not in place of, the government's obligations. Um, to table a neutral amendable motion under Section 13 of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, table a motion to be voted on by Wednesday the 13th of March at the latest, asking this House if it supports leaving the European Union without a withdrawal agreement and a framework for a future relationship on the 29th of March this year. So the United Kingdom will only leave without a deal on the 29th of March if there is explicit consent in this House for that outcome. Third, if this House, having rejected leaving with the deal negotiated with the EU, then also rejects leaving on the 29th of March without a withdrawal agreement and future framework, the Government will, on the 14th of March, bring forward a motion on whether Parliament wants to seek a short, limited extension to Article 50, and if the House votes for an extension, seek to agree that extension approved by the House with the European Union and bring forward the necessary legislation to change the exit date commensurate with that extension. So the, the Government would, is committing itself to bring forward and therefore uh, clearly to support such legislation. These commitments all fit the timescale set out in the Private Members' Bill in the name of the Right Honourable Member for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford. They are commitments made by the Prime Minister and the Government will stick by them as we have previous commitments to make statements and table amendable motions by specific dates. Now for... Yes. I'll give them. To my 
Right, hon. Friend, may I say to him, first of all, that I enormously welcome the fact that he has reiterated all of that from the dispatch box. I personally have had no cause ever to doubt that what the Prime Minister states from the dispatch box will be anything other than fully fulfilled, but his repeating it today is helpful, as indeed the remarks of my right hon. Friend, the Brexit Secretary, earlier in the morning were helpful. And it's my view that in the light of those remarks, there is not a necessity to proceed in the way that the uh, right hon. Member for Normanton and I would have wished with many others to proceed in relation to Amendment C and uh, the bill that came under it. Yeah. And I, I break, break for my right hon. I'll give way to the right hon. Lady. Thank you, sir. If the uh, government brings forward legislation in accordance with a vote in Parliament, would the government presumably still be voting for that legislation? And also, yeah. can he explain what the circumstances would be if there was a disagreement about either the length or terms of the extension between the government and the EU? In those circumstances, will the government bring it back to Parliament for a further vote rather than simply dismissing it and deciding to shift to no deal instead? Well, the, as, as, as the right lady knows, the, the, the Prime Minister said that it would be Short and, and short and limited extension. Clearly, you know, it, is, it is a fact of law that there would have to be agreement with all of the other 27 governments for any extension to the Article 50 period to be agreed. That's just a, a, a reflecting the treaties. Um, it, is, it, it seems to me it, it just logically follows that um, if the government is committing itself, the Prime Minister has committed us as a government to bring forward legislation in these circumstances to comply with what would have been the will of the House. Therefore, the government would be supporting such legislation if it brought it, if it, brought it forward. Um, I, 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 the Honourable Lady has been wanting to get in for quite a long time. So. I'm very grateful to the Secretary of State for giving way. Well, with the greatest respect, he didn't ask the other question my Honourable Friend asked, which is if the EU does not want to agree to a short time limited uh, extension, what will the government do then? Will they come back to the House with a different proposal? This is a serious, you know, honourable gentlemen, shake their heads there. But we need to know, because yeah. if the EU turns that down, then what happens? Do we crash out with no deal? Yeah, yeah. Or do we have another chance to ask for perhaps a longer extension? The, I mean, the, 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 in the absence of a, uh, an agree, either an agreement uh, to extend or to leave with a deal or to revoke Article 50 altogether, the default legal position under the, under the treaties is that once Article 50 has been triggered, the, the exit date is, is two years after. I mean, that is a matter of European law. Um, the, you know, the, 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 on, the, on, the Honourable Lady, if I can just, just respond, the Honourable Lady made, may ask you a perfectly, perfectly serious, um, serious question there. I do not believe that the other governments of the European Union have either an economic interest or a strategic interest in seeing a chaotic departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union. So my belief is that there would be a, a negotiated agreement in those circumstances. But as I have said earlier, in a, the uh, new uh, obligation that the Prime Minister announced yesterday is in addition to the ones which in those circumstances would already flow as a result of Section 13 of the Withdrawal Act and that is Section 13 as modified by the two amendments successfully brought forward by my right honourable learned friend, the member for Beaconsfield. So the matter would come back to the House and there will be an opportunity for right honourable and honourable members to put forward amendments uh, to, to urge particular courses of, of action. I mean, I'm, Mr Speaker, I'm conscious of the uh, concern you expressed about time. I'm also conscious about the applicant. I, the honourable, my honourable friend from St Albans wanted to get it, then I'll come to my honourable friend from Stamford Stamford. Because I have listened very carefully to just about every debate on this topic, and I understand that the European Union would only give an extension if they thought there was a reasonableness behind the request. Can I, and that, and that's, I can perfectly understand that. Can I ask what would be the rationale that we would give 
to ask for this very short and limited extension, given that the House will have already rejected the newly negotiated deal. And I can't think that what else could happen in those couple of months that would be helpful. Is, I mean, my, I mean, tempting though it is, my, my honourable friend is asking me to, to, to go deeper into the realms of hypothetical speculation. A lot will depend, would depend on where we had got to in the negotiations, the reasons for which the House, in these hypothetical circumstances, had neglected, had, had, had rejected the revised agreement. And, and so, let me give way to my honourable friend, Member Stamford. Mr. Speaker, and I thank my right honourable friend. And nobody has a better understanding of these issues than him. And there is nobody whose word I would trust more completely at the dispatch box uh, than him. But this is very, very important detail. And he, in his speech, referred to the fact that the Prime Minister yesterday had made commitments that replicated the provisions in the draft bill, the bill, the Cooper Letwin bill, uh, that we are hoping not to have to move as a result. Now, that bill very specifically set out what would happen if the government proposed an extension, having consulted with Parliament and received Parliament's approval, to the European Union, and the European Union had come back and said, we're not happy to grant that extension, but we suggest a different length of extension, the bill made provision to come back to the House with whatever had been negotiated with the European Union to seek the approval of the House for that actual extension. And it is extremely important yes. that we have that same provision confirmed here today at the dispatch box, because if we do not, then I, for one, will feel bound to continue with the process of supporting the amendment in the name of my right honourable friend for Meriden and then tomorrow supporting the bill. If we can have that reassurance from him that the House will get a chance to approve whatever final extension length is agreed between the Government and the European Union if it is different than the one that the House has previously consented to, then I will be happy. I mean, I mean, I mean the straight, straight answer, my old friend, is yes, yes of course. I mean, frankly, I just do not not see any circumstance in which, um, if there were a, a, a period that had been agreed with the European Union, this, this would or was, had the potential to be agreed, that the government would not bring this back to the House. Were the government not to bring it back, then it would be brought back anyway under the provisions of Section 13 in, in the way that I described in response to an earlier intervention. So I think I can give my honourable friend that very clear reassurance on that point. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. I think he will find it helpful. I have to say, I thought that answer was extraordinarily helpful, yeah. and I agree with him entirely. Actually, the provision already exists under uh, Section 13, but his confirmation of the attitude of the government to that matter, I think, settles the thing. Yeah. To my right honourable friend. If, if, oh, what, he's been trying to get in for a long time. Okay. One last. Uh, Chancellor Jeffrey of Lancaster is extremely generous, and, and I, I do take his word very seriously as well. Um, he didn't quite answer my question earlier on specifically about the legislation that the Prime Minister and he has repeated the commitments of bringing forward on the extension. What would be the form of that legislation, and would, for example, the date be able to be changed? How would disputes over that be dealt with, as my honourable friend, the chair of the committee, asked as well? I, I, I don't think at this stage I, yeah, I can go into detail. Legislation. It would depend a bit on what the, uh, the outcome of the, the negotiations with the European Union itself had, had led to. If it, if it were secondary legislation, then clearly there's the normal constraints on, on amendments. But equally, it's, if it's secondary legislation, it's sudden death in both, both houses. That, that, you know, both houses have a veto over, over, over such secondary legislation. So, um, and, and you know, the Section 13 provisions do give a, a safeguard to the House that there is always that additional opportunity to bring forward and, and vote on concerns that the House feels are, are being overlooked. If I can turn to Amendment C, um, and uh, I'm grateful to my right friend, the member for West Dorset, for indicating that he thought that um, this, uh, this would, would not now need to be pressed. Um, I mean, I, I think that uh, if, if the House will allow me, in the light of his comments, I would not uh, propose to go into detail about um, 
uh, Amendment C, but I am perhaps happy if, if that is still brought up further during the debate. My right hon. Friend, the Secretary of State, when he comes to wind up, can respond to those points. And I do want to refer to Amendment B in the name of my hon. Friend, the Member for South Leicestershire. Now, on citizens' rights, I think my hon. Friend has succeeded in an endeavour that some might have thought was impossible in persuading both the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, and my Honourable Friend, the Member for North East Somerset, to share the honours as lead signatories to an amendment. And all members of this House are aware of how vocally and passionately my Honourable Friend has campaigned on this issue of citizens' rights for many months now. And this is an area the Government takes extremely seriously. We have consistently put citizens' rights first in our negotiations. It was one of the very first areas, parts of the withdrawal agreement, to have been agreed and uh, negotiations completed with the European Union. Of course, the best way to guarantee those rights, both for our citizens in the EU and EU citizens here, is to vote in favour of the deal, which, of course, my honourable friend did in January. But there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding no deal. That is why the Government has already committed that the rights of the three million EU citizens living in the UK will be protected in any scenario. EU citizens resident here by the 29th of March would be able to apply to the EU settlement scheme to secure their status, and the Home Office has already granted more than 100,000 applications under that scheme, and such people will continue to have access to Social Security and health care as before. Now, I, I, I know that also lying behind uh, 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 my honourable friend's amendment is concern about the rights of UK nationals living elsewhere in the EU. Now, in the absence of a deal, this would be a matter for the EU and its member states. And despite the welcome progress made by some member states, there are others where the offer to, EU nas to UK nationals, in our view, falls short, and access to health care is a particular concern. The Government, led by the Foreign Secretary, is actively seeking solutions to address these issues through bilateral contacts with Member State Governments, as well at the same time as seeking a common EU-wide approach. We should not, though, underestimate the challenge in reaching a joint UK-EU commitment, as the uh, amendment calls for. Uh, to ring fence the agreement on citizens' rights. The European Union has been very consistent in saying to us that its legal mandate is clear that nothing is agreed till everything is agreed, and that if these issues were not addressed in the withdrawal agreement, their view is that there are significant legal problems for the EU in protecting these rights since in those circumstances some of these issues would fall within the competence of member states and not of the EU institutions. Now, despite those challenges, we do share with my hon. Friend the common goal of protecting the rights of citizens in the event of no deal. So, in, in view of the fact that our political objectives are the same, the Government will accept the amendment today and we will take up with the Commission Following this debate, uh, the, assuming that the House uh, endorses the amendment, uh, the uh, arguments that have been embodied in my honourable friend's amendment to seek clarification of the EU position on ring fencing the citizens' rights parts of the withdrawal agreement and to see whether they can be persuaded to change the position that they have adopted hitherto. Uh, Mr. No, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, uh, Mr. Speaker I, I'm, I'm conscious that I am disappointing a number of honourable friends and other honourable members, but I think otherwise there's a danger that, that my speech and associated interventions are going to take up pretty well all the time available for debate today. Um, if I can move to uh, the amend Amendment K and then Amendment A. Amendment K in the name of the leader of the Scottish National Party in Westminster, will certain ends without any means. It asserts a determination not to leave 
the European Union without a withdrawal agreement and future framework under any circumstances and regardless of any exit date. It is therefore asserting a power to override what is actually in the European Union treaties that can have no effect uh, in terms of European law and the implications of the Article 50 process. And while I understand the political motives behind Amendment K, I think the problem with that amendment is, is that it, it is just ignoring the legal reality that once Article 50 has been triggered, the only ways in which to avoid what the amendment seeks to avoid are to agree a deal to, uh, or to uh, revoke uh, the uh, Article 50 altogether and, and commit this country permanently uh, in good faith to use the terms of the Court of Justice judgment to membership of the European Union to the future. And for those reasons, the Government cannot accept that. Now, I've also seen uh, and, and studied the amendment tabled in the name of the Leader of the Opposition. And I would urge honourable members opposite to look at what my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, said in her reply to the right honourable gentleman, because at each of the five points detailed in the opposition amendment, I believe the government's deal provides the right answer for the people of the United Kingdom. So let me briefly, Mr. Speaker, take each of those five points in turn. First, the amendment instructs ministers to seek a permanent. Which, uh, Prime Minister, has now been on his feet for over an hour. Is there anything that you could think of from the chair to extol him to perhaps reach his peroration in this respect? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is 63 minutes. The, the, the Minister of the Cabinet Office is known for the intellectual approach that he adopts, which includes analysis in copious detail of propositions advanced by other colleagues, but I feel sure he's nearing that peroration which is keenly anticipated. Minister. I, if the, I mean, if I have, can I just say to the Honourable Member for Perth and North Perthshire that it's his honourable friends as well as other colleagues across the House who have been seeking to intervene, and if somebody intervenes on me, I think they, in justice, they deserve a considered response to the point that they have made. Now, the amend Amendment A instructs ministers to seek a permanent customs union, but the political declaration already provides for the benefits of a customs union, no tariffs, quotas or checks on rules of origin. And at the same time, the political declaration says rather than try and seek a voice in EU trade deals, the UK should have an independent trade policy. And beyond the label of permanent customs union, it's not clear to me what outcomes the Labour amendment is seeking that the political declaration does not offer. Second, the amendment instructs ministers to seek close alignment with the single market, but the EU has already said that the deal provides for the closest relationship possible outside the single market. And frictionless trade in goods in agri-food is one of our key negotiating objectives. And the tr truth is, if the, you know, one looks at the EU position, they have said that completely frictionless trade is only possible if we stay in the single market, and that would mean accepting both free movement and EU state aid rules in full, things which the Labour Party's leadership has said it does not want to see, and that is why I assume their amendment is ambiguous about what a close relationship really means. Third, the amendment instructs ministers to seek dynamic alignment on rights. We are committed to ensuring that leaving the EU with, uh, will not lead to any lowering of standards in relation to workers' rights. What we are prepared to do is to commit to giving Parliament a vote on whether it wishes to follow suit in the future whenever EU standards in areas such as workers' rights or health and safety are judged to have been strengthened. Fourth, the amendment instructs ministers to seek participation in EU agencies. The political declaration sets out how we aim to uh, participate in EU programmes in a number of areas and have the closest possible relationship with EU agencies in the heavily regulated sectors. And fifth, the amendment instructs us to seek agreement on the detail of future security arrangements, including participation in specific EU tools 
and measures. And, and frankly, anybody who has listened to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, speak from the dispatch box, whether as Home Secretary or as Prime Minister, can be in no doubt about her commitment to the closest, most effective possible partnership now and in the future between police and law enforcement agencies in this country and those in other parts of the European Union. But what the amendment ignores is the very real negotiating challenge, that the EU, which is the EU's position. They say that as a third country outside the Schengen area and without free movement, there would be restrictions on the UK's ability to participate in some EU tools and measures. And we do a disservice to the House if we do not recognise the reality of that negotiating well, challenge. Mr. No, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, I believe that the deal that the government has negotiated provides the best way forward for this country to build its future relationship of friendship and deep partnership with the EU outside membership of the European Union. I believe that with the work that the Prime Minister, my right honourable friends, the Secretary of State and the Attorney General are undertaking to get the changes this House has asked for to the Northern Ireland backstop, that we can come back with a deal that the House should be willing, indeed eager, to endorse. That way we will be able to deliver uh, uh, a result which both honours the outcome of the 2016 referendum, but does so in a way that protects jobs, prosperity and security of citizens in every part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Order. The question is as on the order paper. Sir Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support Amendment A in my name and the name of the Leader of the Opposition. It is two weeks since we last voted on a government Brexit motion, but nothing has changed. The Government is no closer to making progress, and that is clear from the Prime Minister's statement yesterday and underlined by the absurdly limited motion that is before us today. The motion that the Prime Minister has put down is that this House notes her statement of yesterday and notes the discussions between the UK and the EU are ongoing. Mr Speaker, the Government does not even dare lay a motion reflecting the decisions of the 29th of January, as it did last time. It is frightened to lay a motion, even setting out what has already been agreed, namely the so-called Brady Amendment and the rejection already by this House of no deal as an acceptable outcome. So the statement of motion just seek to buy another two weeks and note what's doing, all of this with just 30 days to go. One thing that's changed is the acceptance uh, of the amendment by the member for South Leicestershire. And I do just want to ask some questions about that, because yesterday the Prime Minister appeared to rule out accepting that amendment. This morning, the Home Secretary was before the Home Affairs Select Committee and he was questioned by the member for Cumbernaut um, who said, what's wrong with the amendment? Home Secretary, nothing. So the government's supporting it then? Answer, yes. What do you mean? When was the government not supporting it? When did you hear that? Question, yesterday. From whom? The Prime Minister. <laughs> did you? Shambles. Shambles. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, it does rather... It's a, it's, a, it's a vignette on, on, on how Brexit has been going. But I think that the, the question that uh, the House is, is struggling with is why the member for South Leicestershire has been forced to resign in the circumstances where the Government is accepting his amendment. Mr Speaker, last time we had this debate, d debate. I set out the sorry history of the government's delays in recent months, and I don't intend to repeat that. Uh, I, I will. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Speaker. I, I am very grateful indeed to the right honourable and learned gentleman for allowing me to make an intervention. I, I thought perhaps um, the honourable gentleman, the right honourable gentleman, was going to also mention the other significant change, and that, of course, has been the Labour Party's policy towards a second referendum. Yeah. The Right Honourable Gentleman will know very well that the Prime Minister warned in January of this year that the second referendum 
and her words were, could damage social cohesion. Was, do the Labour Party believe that the Prime Minister was wrong on that? Yeah. Or is the Labour Party prepared to take that risk? I, I'm grateful for that intervention. I will deal with it. I'm going to come to that. I'm going to deal with the background. I'm going to come to the amendment that we put forward, and I will come back to that. I will answer that intervention. If I don't, I'll take another intervention to make sure that um, I do. But just going back to the history, because there is, I'm afraid, um, it seems, an expectation that between now and March the 12th, there's going to be a change to the deal. And I don't think that's going to happen. And I'll tell you why not. I'll tell you why not. Because there's been no progress at all since the vote was pulled on December the 10th. That's 79 days ago. 79 days. That was when the Prime Minister said, I'm going to seek changes. I know what the House wants. 79 days. No progress has been made since the meaningful vote was lost on the 15th of January. That was 43 days ago. And no progress since the Brady Amendment of the 28th of January, 30 days ago. And so for all the talk of discussion here and in Brussels, the stark truth is this. Not one word of the withdrawal agreement or the political declaration has changed since it was signed off on the 25th of November of last year. Not one word. That's 94 days, three <coughs> months ago. The expectation that in the next 14 days all of that is going to change seems to me uh, extremely unlikely and not going to be fulfilled. And I said when the Prime Minister went off to do this that she was building an expectation that she would not be able to fulfil. And I fear that's what we're heading for. The deal today is the same as it was three months ago, and it is that basic deal that will be put before us again on the 12th of March. It may have some warm words around it. The Attorney General may be asked to say what those warm words mean, but the withdrawal agreement will be exactly the same in two weeks as it is now. And we have to face up to that. We have to face up to that and, and stop deluding ourselves that that is going to change in the next 14 days, because there are very serious consequences uh, if that deal doesn't go through, because it's precisely the same, which is why there's been such questioning this morning about what happens next. The reason it hasn't changed is because the government has made three central demands. Firstly, a unilateral exit to the backstop. That has been roundly rejected every time it's been asked for and the deal was signed off 94 days ago. They have asked, secondly, for a time limit to the backstop. That has been roundly rejected every time it has been asked for, and it, was asked, uh, and it was on the table 94 days ago. The only other area, or the only other ask, is that the backstop be replaced by alternative arrangements. The response of the EU to that to the government has been, well, what are you proposing? What are these alternatives so that we can discuss them? And nothing has been forthcoming. We learned from the Prime Minister's statement today and from the Minister for the Cabinet Office at the dispatch box that there will be a joint work stream which will be considered by the EU and UK, and this may be an important strand. Now, I don't doubt that a joint work scheme stream on alternative arrangements isn't a good idea. I don't doubt that any country would seek to streamline any checks at the border, whatever the arrangements, irrespective of Brexit. What I do know is that is a work stream that apparently is going to work through till the end of next year. The announcement that that work stream is in existence is hardly a breakthrough. It is hardly a breakthrough. The idea that the deal that was so roundly rejected is now going to go through because there's a work stream on alternative measures <laughs> seems to me unlikely. And that's why we have got to get real about what's actually going to happen in two weeks' time. And that's why we do predict that we'll be left with exactly the same deal. Uh, and on the alternative arrangement, the Minister for the Cabinet Office says, well, it's, it's words, those words are used elsewhere in the... Uh, in the um, withdrawal agreement um, and the political declaration. And that's true. But they're only used in two respects, two different meanings. One is the alternative arrangements are the future, relations, uh, future relationship. 
That's one meaning attributed in those documents. Well, that's not relevant to this discussion, because if the future relationship is ready, there's no question of a backstop. We all know that. The only other way in which alternative arrangements are actually used in the documents, when you read the documents, um, is the technology um, at the border making all the difference. We've been searching for that for some time. I don't doubt there will be advances in technology. But the reason that the backstop was put in was because the assessment was back in November that there was no prospect of that technology being ready by the time the backstop would be needed and therefore we needed the backstop. That was the conclusion. And I know because, because Mr Speaker, since I've been in this role, I seem to spend quite a lot of my time standing on borders, um, looking at lorries and people going across borders. I, I, I went to the Sweden-Norway border, the main border, to see what a border looks like where you've got a country which is in the EEA and therefore got single market alignment and free movement, but not in a customs union. It's a hard stop with infrastructure, with security, with paperwork, and when it works well, each stop takes 13 minutes. Now, those two countries are, those, those two countries are not... Um, operating the least efficient system that they can. They think they're operating the most efficient system they can. Now, I don't doubt it can be improved on, but I doubt that this work stream, this work stream in the next few months, the end of next week, is going to make the progress that many people in this House yeah, think is going to happen. I, 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 I will be brave. I, I thank the Honourable Member for giving way. He has just now referred to spending a lot of his time standing at borders. When he was at the border in Northern Ireland, did he, was he able to see and grasp the complete and total complexity of that border, the hundreds of crossing points that there are, and the total impossibility of anyone anywhere constructing a hard border that couldn't be avoided with ease? I, 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 I was. And I have. I visited that border many, many times. I visited with, with the police service of Northern Ireland many times when I was working there for five years as they policed the area around the border, which has particular issues. Um, and I've been there since um, on a number of occasions. Um, and, and I'm well aware of the nature of that border. I'm also well aware of the fact that in relation to that border, it's a mistake to think that the only issue is technically how you get people or goods over a line in the road. That border is the manifestation of peace. It is a settlement between two communities. And therefore, the very idea that this is just a technical exercise doesn't understand the nature of that border. I will just press on, then we'll, I, I will give way. When, uh, I'll give way, and then I think I've heard one of them. I'm most grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. It goes beyond that, doesn't it? And he may share my anxiety that this issue seems to be consistently ducked. We have a pre-existing international treaty with Ireland which places obligations on us in respect of the border. And I do worry, and he may share this anxiety, but in this House, this is constantly brushed under the carpet. Whereas, as we are a rule of law state that believes in the international rules-based system, we cannot depart from that without reneging on that obligation. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for that intervention, and I, I, and I agree with it. Mr Speaker, when the Prime and, and, and this is really the heart of it, we know what the problem is, we know what the House thinks about the backstop, we know that there's an unlikelihood that those problems are going to be addressed in the next 14 days. So when the Prime Minister lost the first meaningful vote, she had a clear choice. Choice one, plough on with the failed deal in the usual blinkered way and eventually put the same deal back to us. That was option one. Or two, option two, drop her red lines negotiate changes that are credible with the EU and could command a majority in this House. The Government has chosen the first course, blindly ploughing on rather than really engaging. And as we've seen from the last few weeks, that path leads nowhere. Now that is regrettable because there's an alternative, and I want to address Amendment A. We've set out this alternative repeatedly over recent months, and it was set out in full in the letter from the Leader of the Opposition to the Prime Minister on the 6th of February. And it's spelt out in today's Amendment A. I remind the House that the focus of the changes we're calling for are to the political declaration, not the backstop. 
and they are to negotiate a permanent and comprehensive UK-wide customs union. That's the first part. Why is that important? Because it's essential to protect it for protecting manufacturing and particularly the complex supply chains and to avoid the hard border in Northern Ireland. I know um, that uh, those on the front bench and uh, opposite, um, uh, like myself, have gone to many of the big manufacturing companies to discuss with them their complex supply chains and how anxious they are about protecting um, the customs union arrangement that allow them to do that. It's essential also, as I say, to avoid a hard border in Northern Ireland. Now, the, the, I'll just make this point and then I will, I, I will give way. The Prime Minister has pretended that her customs proposals achieve that, and I listened very carefully to what the Minister from the Cabinet Office said just now about Amendment uh, A on this, because he has said, it, the, under the political declaration, the benefits are already there. The political declaration notes the single customs territory in the Northern Ireland backstop obviates the need for rules of origin. So the political declaration notes, notes the backstop, which is the contentious bit of the withdrawal agreement. So it notes it. Now that is a form of customs union. I concede that. In the backstop, that single customs territory does obviate the need for rules of, of origins check. The declaration goes on, and this goes to the heart of what the Minister for the Cabinet Office just said. It says, if we build and improve on that customs union for the future partnership, we can continue to avoid customs checks. Well, let's just unpick that. If we build on the backstop, which is the bit that, as I understand it, many, many members opposite don't like, we can get to the position of avoiding customs checks if we build. So the temporary backstop, so contentious, never to be used, only an insurance policy, hope never to do it, has to become permanent, turbocharged, and the foundation stone of the political declaration in order to get the protection of a customs union. That is precisely what the political declaration says. And I'm not sure that the Minister of the Cabinet Office has explained that to all of the members behind him, because if the proposition is that the backstop is not just a short-term temporary measure, it's actually the essential foundation of the political relationship, I think it might be met with a particular response. And of course, the, the, the pretend, the, I will in just one second, the, the, the pretense that the political declaration equals the same as a customs union, it goes against the stated aim of the government to be outside a customs union. I will give way. I my listen with care to the Chancellor of Duchess' response to the five principles at the end of his speech. Did it seem to the Right Honourable Gentleman that the Chancellor of the Duchy did not disagree with any of the five principles? Uh, rather, I don't disagree with any of them. And he tried most of the time to demonstrate their compatibility with the political agreement. He might have hesitated because in the Chequers policy, the government went beyond this. It was proposing a single market in goods for about uh, 48 hours at uh, that stage. So, we, although this is only, he raised negotiating points about uh, what about uh, new trade agreements with other countries? Uh, what would it mean for freedom of movement? But all that's covered in the negotiations eventually. Wouldn't it help if the two front benches could agree on these five principles? It might transform the atmosphere of this debate when we move on to the next stage of the negotiations after uh, the withdrawal agreement. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that intervention, and as has already been alluded to, um, I am having discussions um, with the opposition front bench, including the Minister for the Cabinet Office. I, I don't intend to disclose um, the, what's been said in confidence in those discussions, and they will continue, and we will play our part in them. And I know that we're trying to set up the next uh, meeting, and we'll do that as soon as possible. I just, want to, I, I just need to address this point. But the point... The point, I will, I just want to finish answering this question. The point is this, that unless and until there's a change of the Prime Minister's red lines, it's impossible to find any space for those negotiations to progress. And, 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 and so far, I don't rule out something dramatic uh, next week, maybe the Prime Minister coming to the dispatch box and saying, I've now understood that my red lines were the problem and I'm prepared to change them, but I don't think it's going to happen. I have concluded that the Prime Minister is going to plough on with the deal that she put before us last time. 
and that she is not um, willing to drop her red lines that would allow a more fruitful um, progress in those discussions. I say, that, I say that without prejudice to the fact that those discussions will go on between now and the 12th of March, but the fact that there is a date already for the deal to come back already set in two weeks' time mm. makes me just a little cautious in suggesting that that is going to bear fruit in that, those next two weeks. I, I will give way. And then we'll very grateful for the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. As he knows, I shall be voting for the Prime Minister's deal. And actually, I think something has changed that he didn't admit at the beginning of his speech, which is the circumstance of the last 24 hours, which I think may change minds on these benches quite significantly and favourably. But if it doesn't pass, uh, while I completely agree with him that under those circumstances the government will need to look again at its red lines in order to try to get an agreement, which is somewhere in the region of what the Honourable Gentleman has been describing, will he also commit from his benches that the Labour front bench will exercise flexibility? So, because actually my whole experience of dealing with coalition government was it takes two to tango. You have to have flexibility on both sides to get to an agreement. I, I'm grateful for that intervention. And, um, we are playing our part in those discussions with the government and will continue to do so for as long as is necessary. I, I don't want to go into what we're discussing, but we will continue to do so as, as long as is necessary. I'm just slightly um, cautious as to the likelihood that that's going to lead to a breakthrough in the next 14 days. I, I must say that uh, the Honourable Gentleman is possibly generating more alarm than he realises. The idea that uh, there is going to be some compromise between the two sides of the House on this question does, in relation to the red lines, does actually raise a very simple question, and it's this. Uh, would the Honourable Gentleman like to state on behalf of the Opposition that they would like to see the repeal of the repeal of the European Community Act 972? Um, Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm grateful for that uh, intervention. Um, what, 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 because what, what, it, what it demonstrates is the point I was trying to make about the customs union, which is if the government front bench say our political declaration is in effect a customs union by a different name because we're going to build on the backstop and make it permanent and turbocharge it, I suspect there's going to be a degree of opposition to that if I've understood anything about debates that have been going on here for some considerable time. Uh, uh, and that's where the difference um, is. As, as for re the repeal of the 72 Act, um, I have always said and, and stand by it that um, repealing that Act and putting a date for leaving in the Withdrawal Act was a mistake and I've always, because of the transition period. And I've, al I've always said that the Act we've passed will have to be repealed before it comes into force. And so it will. The implementation bill, the White Paper, specifically says it's going to, as the Honourable Member uh, well knows. In other words, between now and the end of March, we've, we have got to intercept that withdrawal act we've passed um, if there's going to be any order to leaving the EU um, and ensure that things like the ceasing of the jurisdiction of the European Court is changed. It was balmy to turn the European Court off on the at 11 o'clock on the 29th of March. That's the current law, because you can't get on to transition. Uh, and, and I always said that before that comes into force, if this is going to make any sense at all, it's going to have to be changed, intercepted and repealed. Um, and that is exactly what the implementation bill will do. I am as sure as I could possibly can be. I'm, go I'm going to press on because I I I'm just going to make some progress. I will, give in I will give way in just a minute, but I am conscious, Mr Speaker, and, and I don't criticise the Minister for the Cabinet Office because I think he quite rightly took interventions from people, uh, from a number of members, that they really did want um, detailed answers too, but I, I am going to try and make some progress, because otherwise between the two of us we really are going to get to the wind-ups before we've uh, gone anywhere else. Um, on, on, so let me move on to closer alignment with the single market. Um, this part of the Brexit debate is too often ignored, um, i.e. how do we protect our service sector, which of course is 80% of our economy and 80% of our jobs. Um, and it's the second part of this package that's also needed alongside a customs union in order to prevent a hard border in Northern Ireland. And we recognise that if you're going to have closer alignment with the single market, you do need that underpinned by shared institutions, and it would require co uh, accepting common obligations. What they are would be a matter of negotiation, and how we stay aligned um, would be part of the negotiations. And I'm not pretending that would be trouble-free. 
But we do need to, again, the, the uh, Minister for the Cabinet Office said, well, that's effectively there in the political declaration, as close as you can get. Well, it's worth going back to the political declaration that uh, the Prime Minister has put before us, because what it actually says is that we should achieve, quotes, a level of liberalisation in trade and services well beyond the party's WTO commitments. Well, you can't aim much lower than that. <laughs> that is, to quote the former UK permanent representative, uh, about as unambitious as it can get. The third part of, uh, of the amendment for the House is dynamic alignment of rights and protections. That means UK standards keeping pace with evolving standards across Europe. Why is that needed? Because we can't allow UK workers or consumers to see their rights lag behind uh, those in the EU after we leave, or frankly, to allow future governments to erode those rights. Now, again, the Minister for the Cabinet Office says, well, that's effectively there in the political declaration or being promised by the Prime Minister. There is a world of difference between keeping up with evolving rights and a non-regression clause that simply says they won't drop behind the frozen level of those. And so the answer uh, from the government simply isn't strong enough. They are only promising non-regression, to freeze, not to keep pace. That is a world of difference. And it's no wonder the trade unions were never going to sign up to that appraisal. Uh, appraisal. Uh, uh, um, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister yesterday said, well, don't worry. Uh, what we'll do is, every time there's an evolution of rights in Europe, we'll come back here and see whether this House wants to keep up. But she didn't say, my government will vote to do so. That would make a material difference, but she didn't. Uh, and so neither we nor walking, uh, working people are going to fall uh, for that one. The fourth and fifth elements are clear commitments on participation in EU agencies and funding programmes and unambiguous agreements on the detail of future security arrangements, including access to the European arrest warrant arrangement. And I don't doubt the Prime Minister's commitment on this. I, I did work with her when she was Home Secretary, and I know how seriously she takes this. But I also know that in the political declaration, it does not say uh, that there's been any progress towards a replica arrangement for the European arrest warrant. And I do know, because uh, with the Prime Minister back in, I think, 2012 or 13, we looked at uh, what would happen if we fell out of the European arrest warrant arrangements and what the old extradition treaties were. And we were horrified by what we saw. O outside the European arrest warrant, it takes about 10 years to extradite someone from countries such as Italy to this country. And there are real live examples of that. Using the European arrest warrant, it takes about 40 or 50 days. Material differences, and there's nothing in the political declaration uh, 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 along those uh, lines. And I do understand the technical problems with Schengen, etc., but one of the barriers here has been the, the determination that the European Court should have no role in everything, anything at all in the future, and thus blocking uh, progress in this area. Now, um, Mr Speaker, I'm not pretending that the plan, the alternative we've set out, is easy or painless to negotiate. I've never pretended that will be the easiest negotiation in history. But I do know this that that kind of deal, delivering a close economic relationship with the EU, would prevent a hard border in Northern Ireland and reduce the pressure on the backstop and could be negotiated. The EU has said as much in recent weeks. We've heard it in meetings with EU counterparts and in public that, it is a, that the Customs Union Single Market Alignment Proposition is a credible proposition. The EU have said it's a promising basis for negotiations. And to quote Michel Barnier, if the United Kingdom chooses to let its red lines change, then the European Union will be ready in, uh, immediately to respond favourably. I think it could be achieved. If the Prime Minister is serious about reaching out to the opposition, she should engage in that proposal. It is clear from her response to the Leader of the Opposition and her blind insistence on seeking further change to the backstop that that is not her intention. So today we put that plan to the House and ask for Parliament to help in delivering the basis for a credible Brexit offer. I, I, I will give way. I am grateful to him for, for giving way. I mean, I have been listening with some interest to his uh, explanation of the five bullet points that are so important in the Leader of the Opposition's amendment, but most of these are fundamentally to do with the future phase of negotiations. They are not specifically to do with the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, and therefore I am still puzzled as to what the major difference between his party is and why they can't agree with the Government to secure Withdrawal Agreement and get that through Parliament. 
I, I, I think I had said earlier that, um, and acknowledged that these points go predominantly to the political declaration and not to the withdrawal agreement. Those two documents cannot be separated because they go together. Um, and, 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 well, the example of that is, is the customs union on the government. What the political declaration says is that it builds on the withdrawal agreement. You can't treat them as two separate documents. That, and the legislation that we're voting on doesn't allow us to vote on them separately. But as for the general proposition that um, do we accept um, that, uh, for example, the backstop, whatever concerns we have about it is inevitable, then yes. And I said that when I stood here two weeks ago, and I make that clear again today. Um, uh, I, I will briefly. Or to the honourable gentleman for giving way. But the leader of the opposition has said he objects to the backstop because it won't be just permanent, it's potentially forever. Does he have any qualms about that at all yes. or not? Because otherwise uh, he, should be withdrawing, he should be supporting the withdrawal agreements since most of this, particularly a little i, is contained within the backstop. Again, I, I, I tried to deal with this last time I was at the dispatch box, but I'll have another go. We do have concerns about the backstop. There are concerns about um, the exit arrangements. There are concerns that England, Wales and Scotland, on the face of it, fall out of single market alignment when you're on the backstop. Um, there are concerns that the protection of workplace rights, environmental rights, etc., and non-regression protections, etc., and the enforcement mechanism isn't the same as it is for other provisions, such as procurement. So there are real deep concerns. But, notwithstanding those concerns, we accept, because of our commitment to the Good Friday Agreement, that at this stage, two years in, with 30 days to go, that a backstop is inevitable. And I hope that makes that clear. But I do not think that you can just separate out the two <coughs> documents and treat them as separate documents to be voted on separately. And the legislation doesn't allow us to do that. The legislation requires both documents to go through um, in order to move forward. I, I will uh, give way. To the Vice Honourable General from the Gimway. But given that Labour Party policy a week ago on a second referendum was different to what it is uh, today, can I encourage him to be more optimistic? Uh, and that is, the Prime Minister could indeed get changes to the backstop uh, uh, timetable limit, uh, get out clause uh, later on. If she does make those changes, if she is successful, given what he's just said, will he then support the government in order that we avoid no deal? I understand the point and the, the force with which it's put. Um, I have to say, given the conversations that have gone on here and in Brussels, that I really don't see the prospect that after 94 days of trying, there's going to now be a breakthrough in the next seven days. Now, if there is, we must all come back. There will be a statement from the Prime Minister and we'll consider what she says. It will only be um, on the backstop. Now, we've accepted the inevitability of the backstop. So it's to try and that is more to try and solve a problem on our own benches than with the opposition. But we will, we will wait. I've always said that we will always look at what the Prime Minister brings back. Uh, it's what we did when she brought back the deal in the first place. People invited me to commit beforehand that we would do this or do that and the other. Um, I said I'd wait to see what it is. I will faithfully wait to see. Um, but I don't think, I don't, at the moment, I personally don't think that we're going to be standing here in two weeks. Uh, with significant changes or any changes to the withdrawal agreement. I will wait and I will see. Um, I know members opposite want to be optimistic. My worry is that there is still this expectation of changes which isn't going to happen and therefore a lack of focus on what needs to happen next. And it is why what the Prime Minister said yesterday was significant because if the deal doesn't go through then obviously what happens next becomes deeply significant. But I will in full answer and we will faithfully look at whatever comes back and consider um, it. Uh, Mr Speaker, so, so, so that is a credible plan. That is a plan that's capable of negotiation. And it's one that the EU are prepared to um, negotiate. The only question now is, is the Prime Minister prepared to drop her red line so that there can be a, a meaningful um, engagement with that alternative proposition? I do invite members to vote for our amendment uh, tonight to ensure that that plan uh, can form a consensus or a majority in this House to take us through uh, to the next stage of the process. Mr Speaker, I do want to underline the commitment we made on Monday that if this amendment, Amendment A, is defeated and the Prime Minister refuses to negotiate a close economic relationship, Labour will support or put forward an amendment in favour of a public vote. That public vote would include an incredible leave option and remain. 
It could be attached to the Prime Minister's deal, what I've called a lock against a damaging Tory Brexit, or it could be attached to any deal that managed to win a majority in the House of Commons. I, I will deal with the intervention that uh, was put for you. It was, it was put to me earlier that uh, this is a course we should not um, adopt because of the uh, social unrest it might cause. Uh, there, are, there are a number of answers to that that I need uh, to put. The first is this, this, this comes at the stage where we're trying to prevent no deal. And I do not think that no deal is going to be orderly and smooth. I think it's going to lead to huge problems um, up and down uh, the country. So it, it needs to be seen as to what it's up against. Secondly, I don't think, um, or I think it's, it's important that we do not exaggerate social disorder because that can encourage social disorder. And I'm really worried about that. I'm not suggesting for one minute that the Honourable Lady, I'm really not. I take very seriously our interventions, as she knows, but I don't think we should casually say, well, it'll be social disorder. And the third thing I'd say is this. Um, I've only been in this place less than four years, but the idea that we wouldn't take the right next step as a matter of principle because we thought there might be social disorder is a very, is a very, very slippery slope. I, I will, I'll give it away to the uh, lady member. Him for giving way. Does he not also agree with me that a parliament that just simply guessed what version of Brexit or outcome people wanted did it and then hoped it was the right one for the British people, that that fundamentally would not be a pragmatic, sensible, sustainable or democratically acceptable way of proceeding? I'm grateful for that intervention for two reasons. Firstly, I have been um, very hard on the Prime Minister and I think justifiably for the fact that she's set out those red lines without any discussion in Parliament or even, as I understand it, in the Cabinet about those red lines. It was her almost personal interpretation of the referendum. In my view, there were many interpretations that could have been put on it and it wasn't um, that one. But the second point is important because I, I am concerned as to whether getting a deal that isn't really liked through at the last minute is going to settle anything. Yeah. Is really going to it's just going to, not going to be closure if there's a night in March when, in, in a sweaty night in March, something goes through that nobody really likes. The idea that that's closure is really worrying. And of course, we're building up the expectation that if a deal goes through, that's it, Brexit's settled, it's all over. Um, that, 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 that it, we, we're still in the foothills uh, because all that's then going to happen is uh, the negotiations on the future relationship, which is going to be uh, it's so thin at the moment. It's the whole thing which is going to have to give. Uh, I, I will give way. I was going to give way behind me first. Well, on the point of social order, as someone who has faced social or disorder in, our, in my own constituency and rightly condemned it, however hard it was for some constituents to hear, does he agree with me? that some in our country on the hard right who are suggesting social yeah. disorder forget yeah. that this is the country that faced down Mosley, Mosley at home, yeah. Yeah. faced down Hitler and Mussolini yeah. abroad. We yeah. can yeah. never give in yeah. to hard right yeah. pressure. Yeah. 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 I, I, I agree wholeheartedly um, with the Honourable Member uh, for that. I, I think there was an intervention here that I wanted to take. Um, I thank the Honourable Jennifer Given Way. And if I can agree with my Honourable from Tottenham, Stoke on Trent was a city described as the jewel in the crown by the BNP, and we took no prisoners in fighting them on the streets to rid them. So there will be no argument for me against that. But the Honourable Gentleman said that there could be a public vote on a deal versus Remain at some point in the future. Could the Honourable Gentleman outline for me, so I'm clear in terms of our party's policy? What is the nature of the deal that he would like to see on a ballot paper that would convince him to vote for that deal rather than vote for Remain? Because it appears to me that at the moment the Labour Party policy is actually to revoke Article 50 at pretty much any cost. The, the, I mean, at, at the moment, of course, at the moment it's important to appreciate that I am pressing an amendment that is in favour of a Brexit deal. Yeah. It is what we, in our manifesto, we said if elected, we would seek to negotiate, we, we, would re, we would end Theresa May's reckless approach to Brexit, we would scrap the Conservatives' Brexit white paper and replace it with fresh negotiating priorities with a strong emphasis on retaining the benefits of the single market and the customs union. And we, we set out why that was necessary. We also said 
um, that we recognise that leaving the EU with no deal is the worst possible deal for Britain and that we reject no deal as a viable option. Well, I, 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 haven't finished answering, I haven't finished answering the question yet. So what I am putting before the House today is entirely consistent with what we said in our manifesto we would seek to do. Um, and and uh, therefore the question will be um, whether we can carry that tonight. If, 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 I haven't finished the answer, and it's an important question, if that can't be done, we are faced in two weeks with what I think will be the Prime Minister's red line deal or no deal. In our manifesto, we rejected both. We rejected both. Um, and in those circumstances, uh, we, would ex we would either put forward or support a, a motion on a public vote with a credible leave option. When we put a front bench amendment three weeks ago or four weeks ago, we said that would, we spelt out that would have to be a deal or, a deal or proposition that had the confidence of the House, um, uh, and the other option would be um, remain. I did say I would give way here. I am very grateful to the Honourable and Learned Gentleman for giving way, and I welcome movement of the Labour Party towards a second referendum. Some people say that a second Brexit referendum would be undemocratic, but does the Honourable and Learned Gentleman agree with Martin Wolfe, writing in the Financial Times today, who said, if democracy means anything, it is a country's right to change its mind? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think that was also uh, repeated by the first Brexit Secretary uh, on a number of uh, occasions, although I I'm never quite sure whether I should quote the first Brexit Secretary um, or, or the second, but of course uh, I listen carefully uh, to the third every time and look forward to seeing me again tomorrow morning at the, uh, at the dispatch uh, uh, box. Now, I'm going to make some progress, um, Mr Speaker, because I I've now been on my feet for 40 minutes. So we are putting forward a credible plan. We are making it clear that uh, if that is not carried and we're left with the option of Theresa May's deal on her red lines or no deal, then we will um, put down ourselves or support uh, a motion in favour of a public vote in order to prevent a damaging Tory Brexit. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, I have got a section in my speech on extending Article 50 and the amendment that has been put down by others. Uh, I, I hear what they say about that and I commend their efforts to push the government on this and to get the commitments we got yesterday and again from the dispatch box today. It would not have happened without the concerted effort on these benches along with others across the House uh, to get that. It is extremely important that we now know that should the deal not go, down, go through on the 12th of March there will be a binding vote. Uh, on no deal. We already have one, and uh, more than one, indicating where the will of the House is. And if that doesn't happen, there will be binding vote on uh, extending Article uh, 50. And in those circumstances, Mr Speaker, I urge all members to follow our amendment. Thank you. Uh, order, just before I call the Right Honourable Lady, the member for Meriden, I have now to announce the results of today's deferred divisions. In respect of the question on the draft, I know the House is eagerly awaiting this, Official listing of securities, prospectus and transparency amendment, etc., EU exit regulations 2019. The ayes were 317, the noes were 280. So the ayes have it. In respect of the question on the draft Employment Rights Amendment, Northern Ireland EU exit regulations 2019, the ayes were 317, the noes were 260, so the ayes have it. In respect of the question on draft Employment Rights Amendment, EU exit regulations, 2019. The ayes were 318, the noes were 288, so the ayes have it. In respect of the question on draft employment rights amendment EU exit number two regulations, I'm sure the House is keeping up, 2018. The ayes were 317, the noes were 288, so the ayes have it. In respect of the question on draft employment rights amendment Northern Ireland EU exit number two regulations, 2018, the ayes were 317, the noes were 260, so the ayes have it. And finally, I know the House is ahead of me on all of these matters. I'm merely reminding them of the prodigious knowledge that they possess on these important questions. In respect of the question on draft financial services contracts, transitional and saving provision EU exit regulation 2019, the ayes were 318, the noes were 281. So the ayes have it. It will now be a very great relief to the House to hear Dame Caroline Spell. 
Mr Speaker, thank you very much. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting to be called quite so early in the debate today, and so therefore I prepared a relatively short speech, having been conditioned by the time limits that have usually pertained in these debates. So I don't expect to detain the House too long with my observations. But I would just like to begin by picking up where the Right Honourable Gentleman for the Opposition left off. I think did think in his final words he did acknowledge that something important has changed. Changed. And actually, it was his right honourable friend, the member for Birkenhead, who did actually intervene much earlier in the debate to say that the atmosphere is changing. And I think he is quite right about this, because the pragmatism and the courage that the Prime Minister showed yesterday in making her statement is indeed a very important change. And I would also like to welcome the Brexit Secretary's recognition that when my amendment carried on the 29th of January, Parliament demonstrated a clear majority against no deal. I listened very carefully to him speaking on the Today programme this morning on Radio 4, and he set out that if this majority should be restated the day after a meaningful vote, if it doesn't carry uh, uh, before the 12th of March, Parliament will have an opportunity to vote on an extension to Article 50 the following day, so I'm pleased now to see that the will of Parliament will be respected. And I do agree with the Deputy Prime Minister, absolutely, that the best way to avoid a no-deal Brexit is to vote for a deal. I did just this on the 15th of January, and I will do so again when a deal is next put. And I really do appeal to colleagues across the House to do the same. Agreeing a deal would help to ensure an orderly Brexit, and this is essential to protect jobs. I have been absolutely simple and consistent on the motivation that I have taken towards this subject, which is to protect the jobs and livelihoods of my constituents and those of honourable colleagues. I give way. Appeal to the Honourable Lady for giving way. The Prime Minister has indeed repeated ad nauseum that the way to avoid no deal uh, is to vote for a deal. Isn't it the case that the way to avoid Parliament voting against a deal would have been to talk to Parliament a year ago to find out what kind of deal might be acceptable to the vast majority of members in this House? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, as, as an experienced former commercial negotiator, and I know that my honourable friend, the member for Erdington, is one of those as well, one thing you do learn about difficult negotiations of this kind, it's no good harping on about the past. You have to focus on the future. You have to be relentlessly optimistic and bring goodwill to the table. But back to the subject that is really closest to my heart, I sounded the alarm months ago about the risks to the car industry of a no-deal Brexit. Many workers in my constituency have already lost their jobs, and more recently we heard the sad news about Nissan and Honda. The loss of jobs is devastating, but far more will be risked if auto manufacturers leave these shores. The chairman of Unipar, John Neal, said in the Weekend Financial Times, if we lose the automotive industry, we lose one of the most powerful drivers of productivity and a powerful source of industrial innovation. The UK is now the ninth biggest manufacturing country in the world, and we just cannot afford to lose this critical industry. A no-deal Brexit does not just threaten car makers. Last night, representatives from the CBI, Next, Bosch, Ford, the TUC, Make UK, which was formerly the EEF, the Food and Drink Federation, the Investment Association and Virgin Media, to name but a few, spoke to a large number of MPs at an event here in Parliament. All these organisations fear the chaos of a no deal and implored parliamentarians to come together and agree a deal. So for those colleagues who think that leaving without a deal is in the national interest, they must answer the concerns of the industries that millions of jobs depend on. Chris Cummings, the Chief Executive of the Investment Association, which represents firms collectively managing around £7 trillion, told MPs last night that £19 billion has left the United Kingdom since the referendum. They can measure that because those are their members. The current run rate of this capital flight is approximately £2.4 billion each month. So the notion that no deal has already been priced into the markets is just simply not true. The full consequences have not yet been accounted for. The human cost of no deal 
is not just jobs and livelihoods today, which are very, very important, especially in constituencies like mine, but they will also impact the value of people's pensions and savings for the future. And Mr Speaker, since I've just touched on the <coughs> pensioners, can I just come back to one point, which is relevant to Amendment B, which I know that my uh, right honourable friend has said the government is going to accept. But if, if colleagues might recall, I sounded the alarm also about the plight of UK pensioners living in other EU countries, especially the provisions for their health care. And if the United Kingdom were to leave the EU without a deal, then, as my right honourable friend said, at present the provisions are not in place to make sure their health care would be paid for. So could I just suggest to my right honourable colleagues that given the size of the contingency fund of taxpayers' money that the government has had to make available for the risk of a no-deal Brexit, some portion of that might actually be considered to bridge the cap of the UK citizens who are already getting letters from the authorities in Italy, in Germany, in France, in Spain, to warn them that from the 29th of March, their health care costs will not be covered, because that is a source of real anxiety and human cost to those people concerned. So, Mr Speaker, businesses did cautiously welcome the Prime Minister's announcement yesterday, which took away the threat of no deal, or capacity to take away the threat of no deal, on the 29th of March, and the director of the CBI described it as a glimpse of sanity. She called on the government to permanently rule out no deal to provide the certainty that business needs. This would de-risk the situation and create the space to secure a pragmatic deal. Mr Speaker, people often confuse risk and uncertainty, because if you have a binary choice between a deal or no deal with 15 days to go, it's a very high-risk situation which creates uncertainty. So the pragmatic response of the Prime Minister yesterday helps to reduce that risk and creates the space then to secure a deal. The contingency planning for no deal has already cost business millions and the taxpayer billions. If I just take one example, Pfizer alone has spent £90 million on no deal preparations. This is money they cannot invest or direct to the front line and it will in the end result in jobs being lost. The Federation of Small Business reports that 85 per cent of its members are not ready for no deal. Actually, as Somebody mentioned earlier, very small businesses don't have the capacity to prepare for a no-deal scenario in quite the way some of the larger ones can. Last night's publication of the government's assessment of the state of preparedness for a no-deal didn't really provide a lot of reassurance on that front. So this is a time to be pragmatic. The Prime Minister has given us a lead. She's being pragmatic. And to deliver an orderly Brexit, we do need to come together across the parties to try and get a deal over the line. And I think if we don't this, we're going to fail our nation. And really, if MPs can't bring themselves to put the national interest first at a time like this, then they should consider the greatest risks we face to security, freight delays, air traffic control, visas, food, medicine and energy shortages, as I mentioned, UK citizens' health care in the EU, scientific research and educational exchange. We've heard more and more of what these are, and all of this direct disruption will directly impact and is impacting the people that we represent. As was demonstrated on 29th of January, there's a clear majority to rule out no deal. I would expect this majority to increase when the next opportunity presents. However, we can't just stand against something. We must urgently build a consensus for a deal that we stand for in the British national interest. It's clear that business needs a deal to deliver frictionless trade and customs cooperation. And I just really ask, are the parties in this place really so far apart regarding some form of customs partnership. The Conservative Party manifesto at the last general election contained the phrase, a special relationship based on a customs arrangement. 
The official opposition is calling for a customs union. I feel that we are within touching distance if there is a determined effort to reach consensus. I give way. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. I would be delighted to hear the right hon. Lady encourage the front bench to confirm that she and her hon. and right hon. colleagues will be allowed a free vote in the event that when we have a meaningful vote again before the middle of March, and if the Prime Minister doesn't win that meaningful vote, will the Conservative Government allow its members to have a free vote in such a significant situation to take no deal definitely off the table on the following day? Well, Mr. Speaker, really, she's okay, right on lady is putting her request through me <laughs> to the government. I, I can't commit the government to that. But, but what I would say to honourable and right honourable members is, it's quite clear to us in this place that these aren't normal political times. Um, I don't envy the job of our chief whip. It must be one of the most difficult jobs on the planet at the moment. And the, the main parties have difficulty with the normal way that we would operate. And much of what has been achieved has been achieved by building cross-party alliances. And actually, you know, I think the public actually feel reassured when they see this happen. Leastways, that is what members of the public in my constituency and members of my party have told me they like to see us working together in the national interest to try and bring about a resolution to this process, because we need it sooner rather than later. So, Mr Speaker, with goodwill and determination, I believe we can get there. We can secure the new relationship with Europe that people voted for. We will enjoy trading on preferential terms with our largest market whilst being outside the constraints of the EU institutions, which many f object to today. That is what over 17 million people voted for, and that reality is now within our grasp. Whether Brexit is delivered on the 29th of March or delayed for a few months, and I'm no great fan of an extensive delay, delay is uncertainty, delay costs business money. I really do get that. It is up to us to back a deal that delivers certainty and protects prosperity and work. So I therefore urge colleagues of all parties carefully to consider the amendments before the House today, but more than that, as debate continues in this place, we must now work more closely together than ever before to deliver Brexit. I beg to move. Thank you. The Honourable Gentleman speaking from the Scottish National Party front bench now has a possibly unrivalled opportunity to demonstrate by comparison with his front bench colleagues just how brief he can be. Mr Stephen Geffins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, here we are with yet another debate and another vote as the clock ticks towards leaving the European Union on the 29th of March, and as the clock ticks towards a no-deal Brexit and a cliff edge that everybody knows would be disastrous, that everybody knows would be damaging. I have to say that from day one, this has been a lesson in gross irresponsibility, and particularly a lesson in gross irresponsibility from this government. So our amendment today is a very simple one and a very straightforward one, and that is to take no deal off the table altogether. Now, in her statement yesterday, the Prime Minister was uncharacteristically clear when she said that we would have a vote to take no deal off the table for the end of March on the 13th of March. And this simply goes that one step forward, uh, further forward to say, why don't we take no deal off the table altogether? Because what we know is through the public statements and also from what we know in, in, in Cabinet, and the, the ministers on the front bench will be well aware of this, is that even members of Cabinet and officials are warning of the devastation that no deal will bring. Everybody knows it's not a negotiating tactic, it's simply a tactic to hold a fracturing party opposite together. And we have a government in peacetime, a government in peacetime that we know is preparing for medicine shortages, that is preparing for food shortages, that we know has discussed martial law and civil unrest, 
And that's something that is deeply disconcerting to everybody and underlines why no deal must, must be taken off the table. Now, our amendment today isn't just something that the Scottish National Party have called for, and I'm grateful to, to colleagues from um, the Green Party, Plaid Cymru and um, the Liberal Democrats for backing that, but it's also something that I know colleagues in the Labour Party and members uh, of, of, of the uh, party opposite have also called for, including in the last speech by the Right Honourable Member for Meriden as well, is in terms we must take no deal off the table altogether, and that is why this is such a simple motion. But as well as these, and, 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 and I will give way, since I mentioned the lady, I will give way to her. Just as he mentions the amendment, I should have made clear to colleagues around the House, having been reassured by what I have heard today and the consistency of what ministers said, I will not put my amendment to the House, just so for clarity. Yeah. And I would and, 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 like to thank the Right Honourable Member for making that clarification. Um, I, I do move the amendment in my name and that of my colleagues, and we will be putting ours, because we think that as the clock ticks, we can't wait for another two weeks. We have been waiting for another couple of weeks or another few days for months and years now. This House needs to take a bit of responsibility about the situation in which we have been left and about for which posterity and history will judge us. And let me on that, for the way history will judge us, talk about the human element of this. Now, I do not want to embarrass him, Mr Speaker, but I am going to say a few kind words about the member of South Leicestershire. Now, a number of years ago, the member of South Le um, Leicestershire asked the Prime Minister, three years ago in Prime Minister's questions, do not make me vote against my parents' interests. And we back his amendment he's rightly put down about EU citizens. We, we, um, we, we, we back him, and we think he's doing a brave thing and a decent thing. And I note remarks that have been made by his former colleagues, such as Lord Duncan of Springbank, about how valuable they thought it was working for him. Now, I hope I haven't damaged his future political prospects <laughs> too much by saying that. I hope not. But I remark on the decency of what he's trying to do and his own personal situation and the bravery of what he's done today. And what I find incredibly striking is that as we have a government where collective responsibility is breaking down, yeah. a Prime Minister who remarks that she doesn't want a cabinet full of yes men because she can't get collective responsibility, where ministers have been able to say whatever they like, regardless of what government policy is, that you end up sacking a member of government for agreeing with you. <laughs> what kind of situation are we in? Mr Speaker, I have to say this is an extraordinary set of circumstances whereby the Prime Minister fails to sack Cabinet members for disagreeing with her publicly and sacks a member who she has agreed with, who the Minister agreed with, that he's not in his place at the moment, agreed with at the dispatch box, and who the Home Secretary found it extraordinary that he was in agreement with them as well this morning. That's an extraordinary state of affairs. And don't worry, I'm sure the member and I will come back to disagree with us on other times. But I salute what he's done today and the way in which he's conducted himself as well as a common decency we too rarely see in this Brexit debate. Now, in terms of Project Fear that we get told about, Project Fear is not Project Fear when it's a matter of fact. Now, right now, one in three businesses is planning to relocate some of their operations and one of ten have done so. The UK is seen as a bad choice for investment, and I quote the Global Chief Investment Officer at UBF Wealth Management, which is, the consensus amongst those investors is that the UK is uninvestable at this point. That is not good for anybody. Not good for anybody. We also have a decline with our public services, and in terms of EU nationals, I will quote, a dramatic decline. 87% in applications from EEA nationals for UK registration, according to the Nursing and Midwifery Council. That crucial public service, where EU nationals fill gaps in the workplace, providing that crucial public services. So much damage has been done by this threat of a no deal. Our amendment is a simple one. I hope members will back it because it is a very straightforward one and will help take away. And on that point, I'll give way to the honourable member who's trying to get in. I thank the honourable member for giving way, but he tends to just simply ignore the fact that the British economy is doing well. We have record inward investment, record low unemployment, record manufacturing output, 
despite all the so-called uncertainty and the doom and gloom that the SNP predict. Don't forget, the predictions last time were so badly wrong, the Bank of England had to very publicly apologise for getting it so wrong. This is the extraordinary thing that I find, and, and the Honourable Member knows I've got huge respect for him. He and I served in the Foreign Affairs Committee together. But he's telling us we can't trust the government's figures. Yeah. Who can we trust anymore if we can't trust his own government? Who can we trust when we're trying to make a judgment? Who can we trust when we're trying to make judgments about the future? We know this is having a real impact, and I'm going to come to some of this shortly. And we're almost three years on from the EU referendum. Mr Speaker, I'm not even entirely sure why we're doing this at the moment. Yeah. I heard, I've just been reading, that apparently Poundland is going to be doing burgundy and blue passport covers. And we could all have a choice, and there'll be a pound to go. Now, Mr <laughs> Speaker, maybe if the government decides to buy one for everybody in the UK, we can all have our own choice. It'll save us a lot of hassle, and it'll be a lot cheaper than it will be crashing out of the European Union as well. Because let's not move, lose sight of the gross irresponsibility of where we've got to. That we have a minority government that is failing to be a minority government. Other European legislators manage it. The Scottish government manages it. It's not always easy. It's difficult. The Welsh government does. But you speak to the other parties. You engage in opposition. You have a government that's trying to run the show as if they have a majority yeah. of 100. Yeah. Mr Speaker, further information. They do not have a majority of 100. They lost their majority at the last general election. We did not lose our majority at the last general election. The government did. But let us not lose sight of where we are. It was the charlatans and chancers who backed vote leave on a blank piece of paper, did not have the decency, courtesy or democratic accountability, and the minister was one of them to put down what vote leave meant. Yeah. Yeah. This is why we are in the mess that we are in today. It is a mess entirely of the Minister and his colleagues' own making. And it is one for which they are paying the price, but unfortunately one for which the rest of us are paying the price too. And what has happened? Let us look at the demand. And I have taken a cut from that side, so I will take an intervention from the Labour benches this time. Does he agree that that mess, that that mess includes business confidence falling in the last four quarters, 3.7 per cent in the last quarter, and consumer confidence at the lowest level since 2012? And the, the member is absolutely right. We have seen business confidence falling. We have seen investment falling. These are a matter of fact. I am going to come on to some more figures in a moment, but I would like to talk about the UK standing in the world. This is something that was talked about. Democracy in the UK standing. Democracy. They talk of unelected bureaucrats with the greatest number of parliamentarians are the unelected ones in the House of Lords. Yeah. That is not democracy, Mr Speaker. In a parliament, a European parliament, which is elected, a commission which is accountable to that parliament, a council made up of the 28 elected governments there as well, it is a damn sight more uh, democratic than this place is. So let us look at what has happened recently. And for all those, and I will give away one last point that. I've been, he's making a very good point about democratic accountability, and I've been sitting on countless um, financial services SIs, which will take powers um, and give them to the FCA and to the PRA and to the Treasury, and will not give them to MPs in this House. Yeah. Mm. It's been extraordinary, and, and the, the hon. Lady, as usual, makes an excellent point about where this government have tried to take it away, trying to take votes from us, trying to take away our way that we hold them to account in a way that you just couldn't get away with in the European institutions, whether you like it or not. And I have to say, in terms of that no planning and that vote leaving a blank piece of paper, Donald Tusk, I think, was being restrained when he said that there's a special place in hell for those who backed Brexit without a clue on how to get there. And for all those snowflakes who feigned outrage about his remarks, this is a man who fought the communists, because they were under Soviet vassal state at that point, unlike others. This is a man who was arrested for his beliefs, stood up for his beliefs, and yet when he, when he point, paints out the blindingly obvious, he gets 
he gets um, he, he gets dragged over the coals for it. What outrage! It was full outrage, and I will give way on that point if he can possibly justify it. I honestly don't think that Slovenia has anything to do with the discussion of the withdrawal agreement that we're talking about today. The amendment proposed by the SNP, which is what the honourable gentleman should be referring to, talks about this. House being determined not to leave the European Union without a withdrawal agreement. Therefore, will he confirm that the SNP will be supporting the government's deal, which will be on the table before the 12th of March? I haven't even mentioned Slovenia yet, but the honourable member knows the reference I'm making. He's clearly, because I know he's, I know he's, he, he's, I know he's a decent member, and I know he's, he's served his country well in the diplomatic service, and I know he will have been embarrassed by the recent remarks in the Foreign Secretary. And I want to talk about. I'm a front bench speaker, and I want to talk about what's happened in terms of the UK standing in the world, of which we are still a part for the time being. That there are those who are quite content to compare the EU to the USSR and can't handle these remarks from Donald Tusk. And this goes to the point that just the point when we need friends and influence around the world, as the honourable member well knows, and I know how hard he works on these things, that we are losing them. And let's look at some of the reactions to that. Carl Bildt, the former Swedish Prime Minister, said, Britain used to be a nation providing leadership to the world. Now it can't even provide leadership to itself. <laughs> Latvia's ambassador to London, Soviets killed, deported, exiled and imprisoned hundreds of thousands of Latvians' inhabitants after the legal occupation in 1940 and ruined the lives of three generations, whilst the EU has brought prosperity, equality growth and respect. Please reflect on that. Please reflect on what our, our closest friends and allies are telling us. And in terms of Slovenia, asked to respond to Hunt's remarks, the Commission's Chief Spokesman on, sorry, this on the Soviet Union said, I would say respectfully that we would all benefit, and in particular foreign affairs ministers, from opening a history book from time to time. But the Foreign Secretary didn't listen. And he doubled down when he went to Slovenia, as the members referenced, and referred to them as a Soviet vassal state, to which the former Speaker of the Slovenian Parliament said, the British Foreign Minister comes to Slovenia asking us for a favour while arrogantly insulting us. Yep. And at a time of crisis, and this is the point, the greatest crisis that the UK has faced since the Second World War, we are led by political pygmies who do not understand the history of those countries who are closest to us, never mind the history of the nations of these islands. They have turned the UK into the political basket case of Europe. There is utter astonishment and bewilderment in Brussels and elsewhere at the decline of the UK. But it's not only there, there's astonishment I find in Scotland at what's going on down here, even by those who, unlike me, back the union here. Now, Last night, and the member for, um, for Broxley was right to raise her point of order last night, and I listened to it carefully. And she was right, and I'm glad that she got the No Deal papers released due to her work, and I thank her for it. It was pretty flimsy, it has to be said. I thought it was quite flimsy, a very small document. The Scottish Government document, there's much more to it there. And their analysis, which the Scottish Government was, was happy to have published a long time ago without having to be forced to, a long time ago has shown that any form of Brexit will be damaging to Scotland's economy. The deal will be damaging to Scotland's economy, and that is why we cannot vote for it. But a no-deal Brexit could result in a recession worse than 2008, causing Scotland's GDP to fall back to 7 per cent and lead to unemployment rising by around 100,000 in Scotland alone. I will give way, because I reference the Honourable Rate. I think that the point that everybody in this House needs, if I may say, to understand is that on Privy Council terms, I saw the entirety of the most recent documents that members of this Government's Cabinet and the important subcommittee had seen. I saw a large number of those documents, and notwithstanding the contents of those documents that make it clear in the words of the business secretary, not the Brexit secretary, he was very keen for me to set the record straight on this, Mr Speaker, because last night I said that he had described no deal as ruinous. I would have liked him to have adopted 
the view of the business secretary, who does describe it as ruinous, but notwithstanding the clear information available to the most senior members of this government, they refuse to take no deal off the table. If I may say gently to the honourable gentleman, I think he might agree, that is the disgrace. They know what a no deal would do to this country and they refuse point blank to take it off the table. <coughs> The, hon the Honourable Lady makes a powerful and valid point, and, and, and might I say, because it's the first time being able to say, it's nice to hear her speaking so much more closely to me nowadays as well, <laughs> on, to, to, to make these points, and I might regret it, she's right. Um, but she makes a very powerful point, as she often does, and this is why our amendment today, and I hope she'll support it, is a very simple one, that we take no deal off the table, because the Cabinet knows how damaging it is. Yeah. Business knows how damaging it is. These papers are there, they've been seen, as the Honourable Lady is correct to point out. And on top of that, in terms of the Scottish Government analysis, we also know that EU structural funds worth €941 million Euros to Scotland across the EU budget period, and we don't know what happens next. Almost a billion euros, and we don't know. University of Scotland have 4,500 EU national staff facing uncertainty. It's something that I see day and daily in my constituency work. And a letter from 150 universities saying leaving the EU without a deal is one of the biggest threats to our universe, that our universities have ever faced. Now, the University of St Andrews that signed that letter has been around for over 600 years. They have a bit of context. They know a thing or two. And you know what stings? Scotland never voted for this. But we were the first to suggest an extension, as common sense. The Scottish Government was the first to propose a compromise that the UK government didn't really have the decency to respond to. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And here we are proposing to work with the government to reach out to take no deal off the table as well. We didn't vote for this, but we have to engage with it and we have engaged with it. And I also pay tribute to our friends and colleagues from different parties who have worked with us on that as well, because that's the right thing to do with where we are. Yeah. And I look at Scottish food and drink. Who think that two, the Scottish food and drink industry think that we will lose £2 billion loss of sales annually. This does not affect the hedge fund managers, it does not matter those who have pushed money off, offshore. It affects those who are the poorest and most vulnerable. It affects small businesses and unemployment in some of the areas of the United Kingdom who can least afford it. Now, I also hear about the EU as a political union. Why would you want to be a member of the UK and the EU? Well, you know what? The EU listens to you. You're a partnership of equals in the EU. It cannot force you to do things. You have a court of justice. You have a parliament. You have a council of ministers. All these things that you have, and the UK has none of them. The EU is a club for independent, growing, thriving member states. There's no place for independence within the United Kingdom. There's no place for a partnership of equals within the United Kingdom. So finally, our motion is a cross-party motion, rules out no deal altogether. It is simple and it is straightforward. We want to take things out of the hands of the Prime Minister, yes we do, but we also want her to commit to this because it has become very difficult, I'm sorry to say Mr Speaker, to trust anything that the Prime Minister says increasingly, with her twists and turns, and I'm sorry to say that. Four weeks away, this seems to be a responsible course of action. So many bits of legislation still to be passed. And finally, on the point, and I've raised many points and I'll, I'll, I'll address the Honourable Member. Just think what we've put £4.2 billion into no deal preparation. Just think what we could have done with the £4.2 billion at a time of continued Westminster austerity, at a time when our public services are crying out for it, at a time we should be tackling climate change, poverty, all these other challenges. Taking no deal and continuing to have no deal is irresponsible, it's irrational, but if I can appeal to some of the Tories, it's also very, very expensive. And I hope that anybody here will join us in backing our cross-party motion today. Yeah. Thank you. We order a five-minute limit on backbench speeches now applies, though I warn colleagues that that limit will probably have to fall. And it is not compulsory to speak to the full limit. Yvette Cooper.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I uh, follow the um, Honourable Member for Stone, I would just, I think, gently point out to him, I'm not convinced that other European countries are looking at us with any kind of envy no. at the moment. No. Given no. the confusion and chaos we seem to be in, I want to move Amendment F and also speak to Amendments A, B, and, and C. Um, we are back here again at our usual fortnightly gathering, in yep. which um, nothing yeah. has changed. The, um, Mr. Speaker, the only thing that's changed in our family is that Ed is currently halfway up Kilimanjaro with Little Mix, Danny Dyer, and Shirley Ballas for oh. comic relief, oh. and which has queued a whole series of bad jokes about which is harder, climbing an extremely high mountain or trying to get anybody to agree anything over Brexit. And I fear that um, his climb, mount, mountain climb, is going to be considerably shorter than our um, <laughs> repeated debates on. I want to just, um, just, just deal particularly with the amendments first before, um, if I have time for the wider issue. The government has changed its position on the next steps if there is no deal in place and agreed by the middle of March. And this is clearly a result of our cross-party bill and cross-party pressure. And I wanted to pay tribute particularly to the work of um, the Honourable Member for right Honourable Member for Dorset West yeah. and for Grantham as well as uh, and for Meriden as well as my right honourable friends and member for uh, Leeds Central for Birmingham Erdington and also for Leicester West as well. Because this has been a lot of cross party work to get this far. Frankly it shouldn't have taken this and it shouldn't have taken the threats of resignation by cabinet ministers to get the government to do something sensible and just put in place parliamentary safeguards in order to avert the kind of no deal that would be hugely chaotic, that nobody has the, done the preparation for, that would mean a real hit to our manufacturing industry, disadvantaging British manufacturing right around the world, that would hit medicine supplies, would push food prices up in shops, the kind of deeply irresponsible circumstances for our constituents. However, I do still have some questions and need some assurances because we have had votes promised and then pulled, we have had motions passed and then ignored. And I would hope that the Brexit Secretary will repeat the reassurances because he will know I have raised questions about his previous dismissing of motions and saying that yep. legislation took priority and previously saying that no deal uh, on March the 29th was the default option. I heard the um, Secretary of State for the Cabinet Office say earlier instead that the default position had now changed and it would no longer be the policy of the government to pursue no deal on March the 29th if there wasn't a deal in place in time and that instead government policy would now be to respect the decision of the House on whether to pursue no deal or an extension of Article 50. And I would just like to have that confirmation. To have confirmation too well, that the... Thank you, Wade, for she was on that one. I'm very grateful she made an excellent speech. Uh, in addition to that confirmation, which I too would like to hear from ministers today, would she like to hear, as I would like to hear, what the government will actually do in that vote? Will they vote against no deal or could they extraordinarily vote for no deal? Well, I think that's a hugely important point and I'll just finish these quick uh, things because then I'll come on to that point. Um, the uh, confirmation to my friend for, right on friend for Leeds Central that the motions will be amendable and also this key issue about if there is a disagreement, let's suppose there is a disagreement between the EU and the UK, perhaps one side suggesting three months, one side suggesting two months. In those circumstances, we just need the reassurance that the government won't shrug its shoulders and say, OK, we didn't get an agreement, we're now just going to pursue no deal after all, and instead we'll come back to this House and allow for some process of resolution if there is a disagreement. And then I really would urge ministers to say how the government would, would vote, because yeah. until we will have uh, our bill, we will keep in reserve. We hope that with these assurances, we do not need to press Amendment C today. I do hope to press Amendment F. I do hope that we can have that confirmation and clarity of what the Prime Minister has said as part of the motion. But I think it was also important for the government to provide some clarity about how it would vote, because businesses still don't know exactly whether there's going to be a majority or not. And we 
can give them some assurances about how people have voted in the past, but the thing they really want to hear is what government would do in those circumstances. Will government, faced with that choice, really want to say we actually want to cause huge problems for medicine supplies for the NHS, huge problems for the short-life radioisotopes that are used for cancer treatment, huge problems for our manufacturing industry or turn motorways into car parks? Will the government really honestly want to do that? rather than just say, do you know what, we might need a bit more time. I'll give way to the I ask her a question as she's taking such a prominent part in this debate. Uh, the same question I put to several people today. Would she countenance the idea on behalf of those trade unionists and those workers who, for example, worked in the ports, who were completely against the ports regulation, that those laws should be made in the Council of Ministers under the uh, control over laws issue I've raised just now, behind closed doors, without a transcript, and effectively be imposed on the, on the United Kingdom without our even being there. Here, here, though. Say to the honourable member that we have to get some form of uh, sensible agreement in place so that people can get on with their lives, so that people aren't threatened with the insecurity of having complete chaos from whatever source if we end up with no deal. I also briefly support Amendment A uh, and in particular the proposal for a customs union. I would just say to ministers, I think if they were honest about being able to reach out and try to build some consensus around something, they would actually recognise that many of the points that are in Amendment A, if in fact they were put to a free vote across this House, I suspect they would get a majority, and I suspect that would be a consensus way forward. And then if I wanted to just deal with the concerns that I have about the tone of the debate. The, member from, the right honourable member from Meriden earlier said that she hoped the tone of the debate was changing and hoped there would be some spirit of compromise. I would say I, I look forward to that, but I am worried that I have still, even today, had comments from members of this House about the agreement that the Prime Minister came to yesterday, but accusing those of us who have been calling for it again of being mutinous, plotters, saboteurs and blackmailers. And I would say I think this is really inappropriate, divisive and counterproductive. Yeah. It really is not, does not, uh, I think, fit with the kind of debate we ought to be having about something so important, particularly when I frankly think it is hugely patriotic to be trying to make sure we can stand up for British manufacturing, make sure the NHS can get its medicines and make sure that British families across the country don't have to pay higher food prices in shops. And I would say as a final thought that in the end, wherever we get to in this Brexit process has to have some form of consensus around it or it will not be sustainable and that is what we should all keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well. Order a four minute limit now applies on backbench speeches. Mr Alberto Costa. Yeah, yeah, thank you Mr Speaker and thank you for choosing my amendment. As all members of this House will probably know I have been a very loyal uh, Conservative member of Parliament. I have never rebelled and I have never scarce, I've scarcely spoken out of turn. I believe and continue to believe that as members of various political parties, we are at our best when we stick together and promote those political policies upon which we are elected. However, when an amendment attracts such broad consensus across this House, including the leaders of every opposition party, and importantly for me, the support of honourable members across the Brexit debate on my side of the House, a sensible government must accept a reasonable amendment, and I am grateful that the Government has acted reasonably in accepting in full my amendment. Mr Speaker, my amendment does not deal in goods or services, backstops or borders, but people living and breathing, skin and bone. That such an amendment is needed is, in itself, a very sad state of affairs. The rights and freedoms of over one million United Kingdom citizens in the EU and over three million EU citizens here in the UK should never have been used as a bargaining chip during the negotiations for our withdrawal from the EU. That such rights were placed on the table in the first place was wrong. Now, whilst I greatly welcome the government's unilateral undertaking, um, that does not go far enough. There is more that we need to do. Now, I back the Prime Minister's deal, and I will continue to do so. But the spectre of uncertainty hanging over the heads of over 5 million people 
It is right that this House of Commons has positively coalesced around a good message. <coughs> and that message, not just to the country, to EU citizens, but that message is also aimed at President Donald Tusk and the European Council, who are listening to um, proceedings carefully. The time for ring-fencing these rights, as I said, was really should have been at the outset of the UK's decision to leave the EU, and it is now imperative that the government do everything it reasonably can to seek consensus from the European Council and get a legal mandate to the European Union Commission to carve out those rights. And whilst the Prime Minister said yesterday in her statement that the EU Commission does not have the legal authority, um, I spoke to Professor Smindens this morning, who is Professor of EU Law at Cardiff University, and he said it is correct that the European Commission has not been mandated to negotiate a separate agreement on citizens' rights. However, the European Council can at any time revise that mandate. There is no legal hurdle at all to this. So I am putting to the Government now. I would like to hear from the Government exactly what measures the Prime Minister will take in ensuring that this amendment, which has been adopted by the Government, is complied with. Will the Prime Minister be writing a letter to President Donald Tusk? If so, when will she write that letter? And what other measures can the Government do in order to ensure that the Council gives that mandate to the Commission to carve out citizens' rights as quickly as possible? Yes, I would. Would my old friend not agree that this should have been sorted out back in 2016? First, we're discussing this now is quite wrong. Yes. Thank you. As I've said in my remarks earlier on, I entirely agree that this is a matter that should have been dealt with at the outset of the United Kingdom's decision to leave the EU. I'm afraid in time I wouldn't, but um, I, I thank the Honourable Lady for supporting the amendment, as well as all the team on her benches. But it is now time that um, we send this message out clearly. Now, there's been some discussion about uh, my position today in government, and what I would say is this. That I think there is a convention that if a parliamentary private secretary tables an amendment that they are expected to resign. That is all I would say on that matter. Um, so, Mr Speaker, I would finally like to thank all honourable and right honourable members who have graciously and very kindly offered to support this amendment today from all sides of the House. We can all take pride in informing our constituents and fellow British citizens in the EU that we do put citizens' rights at the very front. And I should also like to thank, Mr Speaker, the campaigning group known as the Three Million that support the rights of EU nationals here, and another group called the British in Europe who support the rights of British nationals in the United Kingdom. For citizens' rights is not about party politics, it is about people. Thank you. Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, Secretary Stephen Barclay, to reply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government's focus is on securing a deal and passing a meaningful vote by the 12th of March. The Prime Minister has now spoken to the leader of the every EU 27 member state to set out the UK's position. The Attorney General, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, and I have been engaging in discussions with the EU to make progress. And both teams are continuing their work, and we agree to review progress with the EU again over the coming days. Of course, I give way. I thank my right honourable friend. I have two questions. Um, given that the government has accepted in full at my amendment, can he confirm at the dispatch box whether the Prime Minister will be writing to President Tusk, the European Council, requesting that the European Council? give legal authority to the EU Commission to seek to enter into discussions with the UK to carve out the citizens' rights deal, and if so, when? Well, I am grateful to my uh, honourable friend for raising that point. Indeed, many members uh, across the House actually spoke in support of the member for South Leicestershire during the debate. Uh, I am happy to confirm to him that we will uh, right to the EU institutions uh, and that this will be done uh, in the coming days. Because the reality of this, Mr Speaker, is we have a shared goal. 
which is to protect citizens' rights. The Government doesn't oppose the amendment for that reason. Uh, but the issue is more on the European side as to what they are willing to do, because previously they have always said this is a bilateral matter for Member States rather than a matter within the mandate of the EU Commission. But I'm very happy to commit to him uh, to write uh, for the Government to write to EU institutions uh, as he requests. Uh, turning, Mr Speaker, to Amendment C, in the name of my right of all friend, the member for Meriden. Uh, she kindly referenced my remarks in the media uh, this morning, uh, and also those of the Prime Minister, uh, that the will of the House will be respected in respect of a vote on whether to leave on the basis of no deal, should the meaningful vote on the 12th not proceed. Uh, be passed. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to her for indicating, in light of the assurances that we have given to her, uh, that she does not in, uh, intend to move uh, her Amendment C. Uh, that turns then to Amendment F, uh, which again I, I can confirm that the Government will accept. Um, as such, it is no longer necessary because we have made clear commitments uh, to hold a second meaningful vote on the 12th of March uh, and another vote on leaving without a deal. Uh, the Right Honourable Member also asked whether the motions would be amendable. That was a point the Chair of the Select Committee, the Member for Leeds Central, raised. Uh, and I think the point was addressed by my Right Honourable Friend, uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. But again, uh, I am very happy to confirm that, whilst clearly, as he well knows, uh, that these are issues for the Speaker as to what amendments, uh, whether a motion is amendable or not, so that the Government is happy to give that commitment subject to that. So I don't want to preempt uh, what exactly that motion would say, but it is our expectation uh, that a substantive motion would be amendable, and I hope that gives him some uh, reassurance. Um, uh, turning to uh, the comments of the member for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford in respect of the earlier Amendment C, she did specifically ask me to put on the record um, confirmation, as indeed did the member for Pontypridd, uh, as to the Government's position, and I think she wanted me to reiterate the position set out by the Prime Minister. Uh, first, we will hold a second meaningful vote by Tuesday the 12th of March at the latest. Second, if the Government has not won a meaningful vote by Tuesday the 12th of March, then it will, in addition to its obligations to table a neutral amendable motion under Section 13 of the EU, EU Withdrawal Act, table a motion to be voted on by Wednesday 13th of March at the latest, asking this House if it supports leaving the EU without a withdrawal agreement and a framework for the future relationship on the 29th of March. So the United Kingdom will only leave without a deal on the 29th of March if there is explicit consent in this House for that outcome. Third, if the House, having rejected leaving the deal negotiated with the EU, then rejects leaving on 29th of March without a withdrawal agreement and future framework, the Government will, on the 14th of March, bring forward a motion on whether Parliament wants to seek a short, limited extension to Article 50. Uh, and if the House votes for an extension, seek to agree that extension approved by the House with the EU and bring forward the necessary legislation to change the exit date commensurate with that extension. These commitments all fit the timescale set out in the Private Members' Bill in the name of the Right Honourable Member. They are commitments made by my Right Honourable Friend, the Prime Minister, and the Government will stick by them. So whilst I don't normally like to read text verbatim, I hope that specifically gives her the clarification uh, that she was looking to happily give away. I thank the Brexit Secretary for giving away. There are some reports, however, online that the uh, Leader of the House may have said something different and that there might be circumstances in which we could leave with no deal, even if the House had voted against leaving with no deal. Is he aware of that? Uh, I, quite genuinely, as, as I think she knows, I've been sat in the chamber for the vast majority of the debate. Uh, I don't know about any comments, but the reason I was so explicit in what I set out, why the Prime Minister set it out, and indeed my right honourable friend in opening the debate set out, is that is the government position. I hope she can take it in that spirit. Obviously, I don't know what other comments have been made, but those are the comments on behalf of the government and on behalf of the Prime Minister uh, that I'm happy to confirm at the dispatch box, and I hope she can take it uh, in that that spirit. Uh, turning now, Mr Speaker, to Amendment A in the name of the Leader of the Opposition. 
Uh, the right hon. and learned gentleman, the member for Holborn and St Pancras, opened the debate by saying that over the last two weeks nothing had changed, uh, notwithstanding that several members, the member for Leeds, the member for Birkenhead, actually contradicted that. The member for Birkenhead said he thought there had been a change. But I think, actually, he was being too modest, Mr Speaker, because over the last two weeks something material has changed. And that is the position of the Leader of the Opposition. Because in two weeks ago, we thought that he was actually honouring the referendum, honouring his manifesto commitment, whereas now we learn that the Leader of the Opposition is committed to a second referendum. Uh, indeed, he started out with six tests. He now wants five commitments. His five commitments relate to the political declaration, but he uses it to justify not voting for the withdrawal agreement. Even though that withdrawal agreement, he says, has things such as protecting citizen rights, honouring our international obligations, protecting the Northern Ireland border, all of things he says. Uh, and indeed, Mr Speaker, he says he wants to be part of the single market, but then at the same time not part of state aid rules or part of freedom of movement. It shows all the consistency to which we are familiar with the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, turning to Amendment K from the SNP, uh, which expresses its discontent with No Deal, uh, uh, regardless of whether we extend Article 50 or not. Well, I don't think we need a vote in this House to understand that the SNP are discontented. I think we can probably take that uh, as read this evening. The member for North Shropshire uh, raised the issue of alternative uh, arrangements, uh, and I'm happy to confirm that the UK and the EU have agreed to consider a joint work stream to develop alternative arrangements to ensure no hard border on the island of Ireland. Uh, and we will also be setting up domestic structures to take advice from external experts, from businesses who trade with the EU and beyond, uh, and from colleagues across the House. This will be supported by civil service resources and £20 million of government funding. And this work is done in parallel, will be done in parallel, and without prejudice to the ongoing negotiations. Of course. Very briefly, he will know that we wish him well with these negotiations, but can he confirm that when it comes to addressing the concerns we have on these benches and on some of the members opposite about the backstop, that what, what is achieved is not just meaningful, but has a cast-iron guarantee of legal force. The um, ex exquisite timing, Mr Zika. I was just going to come on to name-check the member for uh, Basildon and Billericay, because uh, in addition to referencing the fact we need to address the point, he's just raised the indefinite nature of the backstop, but he also spoke uh, of the need for compromise. Uh, and I think he reflected actually one of the themes of the debate today, which is for those who voted remain and for those who voted leave. There is a consensus in the House in recognising the importance of securing a deal. The best way to mitigate the risks of no deal is to have a deal, and indeed, as the Prime Minister frequently says at this dispatch box, the only way to avoid no deal is either to revoke Brexit entirely, a betrayal of the vote of 17.4 million people, or indeed to secure a deal. So we have listened to members from across the House. We have listened to the concerns in terms of no deal. We have said quite clearly to members across the House that there will be a vote in this place on the issue of no deal. Uh, in doing so, in securing a deal, however, which is our priority, we will protect the rights of EU citizens along with the wishes of the South, uh, member for South Leicestershire, uh, not just in the EU, but also in the UK. Uh, and we will do so in a way that delivers Brexit, delivers on the biggest vote uh, in our country's history. Uh, and that's why I commend the approach set out in the motion. Order, order. Under the order of the House of today, I must now put the questions necessary to dispose of proceedings on the motion. I begin by calling the Leader of the Opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, to move Amendment A, which stands in his name. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, I formally move Amendment A to be put to the House. Thank you. The question is that Amendment A be made. As many as have that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Division! Order. 
The eyes to the right, 240. The nose to the left, 323. The eyes to the right, 240. The nose to the left, 323. So the nose have it. The nose have it. Unlock. Order. We come now to Amendment K in the name of the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Ross Sky and Loch Arbour. To move Amendment K, which stands in his name, I call the Right Honourable Gentleman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Formally move Amendment K. Thank you. The question is that Amendment K be made. As many as are that affiliate and say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Division! Clear the lobby. The eyes to the right, 288. The nose to the left, 324. The eyes to the right, 288. The nose to the left, 324. Thank you. So the nose have it. The nose have it. Unlocked. Order. We come now to Amendment C in the name of the Right Honourable Lady, the Member for Meriden. Not moved, Mr. Not moved. <laughs> Amendment C, not moved. Thank you. We now come to Amendment B in the name of the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for South Leicestershire. To move formally the amendment which stands in his name, I call Mr. Alberto Costa. Yeah. Yeah. Formally, Mr. Speaker. The question is that amendment B be made. As many as I've had opinion and say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Now we now come to amendment F. That is to say, F for pretty in the name of the Right Honourable Member for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford. I invite Yvette Cooper formally to move Amendment F. I'm back to move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment F be made. As many as I've had opinion and say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 502. The nose to the left, 20. The eyes to the right, 502. The nose to the left, 20. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. Order. The question is the motion as amended. As many as have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. 